So let's go back to the teenage years of Luca Hosovar back in Sylvania. Let's talk about that a little bit. So I lived in London from 7 to 11 years old. Um, like, sport was everything. And at age 11, like, basketball became, like, fucking it. You know what I mean? Um, but also, like, when we moved back, my, uh, you know, we moved back to the family because my dad lost his job. But he stayed and started, like, this company. Uh, but we couldn't afford to live there or anything. So my pops didn't move back with me. So he, he lived in London and we lived in Sylvania. Um, and those are those years where I was like, I was already kind of a knucklehead kid, yeah. you know? Um, and and we would start, I mean, I'd start, like, it was like ball. And then, yeah, I'd show up at school because I, I had to show up at school. But really, I was like out a, a lot, and, you know, uh, in the streets, just, you know, doing dumb shit. But by age 12, uh, we, you know, th this is what told me kind of like, I, when I look back, I said, look, I knew I was going to be an entrepreneur. Uh, my dad's friends were like, yeah, this little fucker's going to be an entrepreneur. Because we would, you know, when I lived in London, I was introduced to this whole new world of, of, of I would say, like, at least, you know, fashion as far as, like, you know, hip-hop. I was super into yeah. hip-hop. And you had the FUBUs and you had the Fat Forms and Academics and the Jibos and, like, you know, everything that I've never seen. Well, i only seen in, like, maybe videos or something, right? right? And I was like, oh, shit, like, I, you know, and, and I could buy on sale. I mean, we couldn't really afford a lot of it, but I could buy stuff on sale. And I'd come back in the summers and, like, you know, people would be like, oh, dude, what's that, right? And then when I moved back and I started playing ball, like a lot of the basketball community was to listen to hip hop. I mean, those two go hand in hand, no totally. matter where in the world you yeah. are, right? Always. And they would be like, dude, what's, you know, where'd you get this? Like, how can I? You couldn't buy any of those clothes in Slovenia. Like, honestly, nowhere close. And so I'd bring some stuff back, but then it just became like, you know, how do we get our hands on this? And um, my friend Giga, his, his mom had his, uh, friend that would like so like she would sew a lot of stuff jeans and jackets and anything you kind of could imagine so we took my favorite pair of Sean John jeans and we're like hey uh you know she could took them and say hey can you recreate these like pretty much stitch for stitch right and she's like yeah I can I can pretty much make that happen um so her company was called Musher so think Usher with an M okay right? yeah. so that we were like hey can you make that tag really small okay cool and like, we were fucking recreating <laughs> okay, she would put that tag she on would too. put a tag on it but it was like we, we left it completely clean it was like a really small tag yeah uh, like right here you can barely tell and uh and like when we found out that like, she would make these for like seven or eight bucks so that's how what she would make it for and uh we're like no shit can you make all colors and like different materials right Cause then like the, the guys that the, that we play ball with or like the guys that we hung around that like listen to hip hop and stuff, I'm like, yo, can you can you get them in brown and make it this material? Like, so we would be going back. And they was like, yeah, she could make anything. So we started, like, and we were selling these jeans for like 50 bucks. You know, make, getting them for 70 bucks, selling them for 50. We are like, yo, it's crazy. So we would always sell out. Like we'd get batches, sell out, get batches, sell out. And then we were ordering so much that, you know, she pretty much couldn't keep up. She started making mistakes, you know, like instead of a 32, be a 35. Right. Dip, you know, wrong color. And, and of course, like now you're throwing it and you're like, dude, what are you doing? And uh, then the final straw came when Giga's brother went out, out there with his mom one time. And I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's like, I think he mentioned what we were selling it for. Okay. And the lady was like, all right, tri triple the race, whatever. You know, that was the end of that. But it was, but it was kind of like, to me, the inside of like, I always try to, figure out like what people wanted and give that to them mm. now sometimes that turned into you know the wrong thing right because it's like you know I, I went from doing that to we'd like rob and steal and like do a lot of you know by the time I was like 13 14 breaking into cars you know, stealing people's wallets and doing even dumber shit like you know stealing cars and um, you know and that turned into you know selling drugs by the time I was like 15 like 15 going on 16 and that happened for me it was like when I was uh, it was actually a friend of mine we used to play street ball with him, uh, became a close friend, and we kind of heard through the grapevine that he was connected and we could get stuff. And w you know, one day we're driving, and he's like, "Hey, uh, hey man, like, you want to make a bunch of money?" Now, of course, you ask me that question. That's obviously, <laughs> like the magic, you know, the magic right, question right. is like saying, "Hey, you want to lose 40 pounds?" <laughs> yes. And um, so you know, I was like, "Absolutely." So he's like, "All right, look. So this is what I do." You know, kind of let me in on it. So next to him, and uh. He's like, I'll give it to you without you ever having to pay me, like until you don't sell it. Which is, by the way, like that's not normal, right? I mean, for for majority of the time. Also, I would get it at rates that like were literally there was no minimum, right? He was he was the top dog. He was very very undercover, but he was a top dog. And and I, I remember, man, like I, I went to the first back then. This is like the time that this is the peak of rave, right? In Europe, mm. um, rave parties, hangers, thousands of people, you name it, right? And I went to. Um, and I knew some of my friends would go to rave parties. They love rave. 
And I was like, man, you guys are the red parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, so what if, man, if I gave you guys, if I supplied you with Nepo free, could you guys connect me? You know, and they were absolutely. I mean, you, you know, this is like business marketing 101. You That's know, what like I was back say. Yeah, in the day, yeah. You know, and so I would go to my first rave party, and um, man, in like two and a half hours, I sell 330 pills, sold out, because they were just like, hey, it's my guy, and I was, I was under. I mean, I legitimately was because I got, I, I got a better price than everybody. I could sell for less, you know, and I was just selling out. And I mean, that night it was like I came home, you know, with more money than my mom made in a month working at the bank, right? Like literally, I'd go to school just as much as I need to. Every summer I had to redo, you know, um, and, and it wasn't because I wasn't like, I couldn't make that shit happen. It was just like, for me, I would have been a kid with ADD. Like they would like today, they would have been like, dude, you need every pill there is, yeah. is possible, you know? And, and so I practice basketball like fucking four or five hours a day or more. Uh, you know, go to school for a couple hours. I show up at other people's schools, and it's just like phone, sell. You know, go to parties, whatever. And and uh, you know, and it went from that. We went from from E to LSD to then we'd go to, to Coke. And and it's like I mean, for you know, I was never Tony Montana, but like yeah. at that age, I mean, like you know, I was making. Put it this way, I came to you know, I came to school with a Motorola Active with a voice voice phone, like. Call my brother, you know, and it's just like people are like, what the fuck, you know, gold ring. I mean, I still got pictures I can show you to be like, what is going on? Like gold rings, gold yellow chains, you know, the whole the whole spiel. But well, well, let me ask you about the about the the mindset then, because you hear, you know, I know you now, and people know you now as someone who has such an undying belief in yourself that you can make it. You know, obviously running this incredible legitimate business, but you know, you might hear from Jay Z, or you'd hear from Big or Nas or somebody or Puffy who grew up in that kind of atmosphere. And we understand that because that's in the U.S. So over there, at that time, did you think there was like a sense of hopelessness where you couldn't live that lifestyle and make that kind of money in a legitimate business? Um, well, I, were you I, too young? You know what? You know, the funny thing is, is like honestly, at that point in time, the only other alternative for me, like I, I don't even think that I was thinking, could I not make it any other way? Uh, it, for me, it was like I'm going to play pro ball. Yeah, I'm selling dope. Yeah, and and then you go, you know, it's 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 a very interesting thing, you know, about how environment tri like triggers your thought pop process and behaviors. Because I look back now, and I was willing to do things that I never think I'd do. Right. You know, I don't think even now, you know, it, it doesn't cross my mind in any type of normal way. But I mean, I was like, you know, you talk about guns pulling out guns on people and you know doing crazy stuff. And I mean, like, you know, I I, I did these things, and it's like you're kind of I'm not like saying that to be like proud or anything like that, but. You know, when you're in an environment, I mean, I would be, you know, sitting with like really, 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 really high up people, crazy. I mean, stuff that, you know, pe the movies are made about these people. Yeah. And you're sitting there, like, you have to become that. Like, you, you, you just shift, right? You can't, you can't show up like you would with your friends playing basketball. Yeah. Ah, like you're there, and it's like, man, it's, it's business, and like your, your mind goes on to like, oh man, can we get like seven thousand pills and shipping? But you know, th that's how you think, right? Yeah. And so. I was now, how much did that shape your kind of your hustle and your business mindset that you have today? I'm, how big of an influence I mean, was that? A lot. Yeah. I, I, when I look at, at back at it now, it was a lot. And, it, and the thing is, like, I mean, at the end of the day, there's two things that really drive you, right? There's desire uh, of pleasure, or you know, the desire to get away from pain. I, yeah. I don't care. I mean, that, that's really at our at our um, at our foundation, right? Like, so when I look back, I mean, there was a desire, right? And and I. I had a, all of that time, I know when I look back now, I was chasing significance. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it was uh, always, you know, cause I was, I was the youngest brother, I was the smallest kid in ball. Like, you, you know, you're, when you're in the Balkans, like, I mean, I'm pretty much like, everybody's taller than me, you know, everybody, yeah. like, you know, genetically I wasn't super gifted. Um, I wasn't the worst, but I definitely was nowhere near the best. I was kind of like that lukewarm, shitty middle that you, mm -hmm. anybody hates. But like, you know, and, and it's like, on top of that, it's like my mom was, uh, you know, always like, oh, look at the neighbors, you know, they got the, you know, they're going to law school and this and that, like nothing was ever good, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like everybody was always better. And my pops wasn't around, and my, my pops was a big supporter, but, and he was hustling and trying to make the best life for us, you know, working in England, which is obviously you can make a lot more money than working in, in Slovenia. So, yeah. so it was kind of like this, you know, my brothers, uh, I have two older brothers, both of them at peak uh, points in time, like uh, when I was 15 or 16, my, Matei moved over to, to England to play soccer, right? So boom, he's gone. Uh, my older brother went to New Zealand for like a two year stint, played rugby work. So me and my mom are like already like this, yeah. you know, and I'm just like, you know, I mean, you talk about like, hey, be at home, like, fuck, man. like I'll do whatever the fuck I want, right? So basically it's like this, this, this drive for significance, right? Like, 
I, I, and like, how can you be significant? Well, I have money, I have positioning, I, you know, you, you pull out a lot of cash in front of the girls, you got gold rings, you're playing ball, like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm rapping, blah, all these different things, mm -hmm. right? Also, like, hey, what's the fastest way to put yourself in power? Bam. Yeah. I'm powerful now, right? Yeah. Like, and it's all obviously bullshit. It's all surface. Like, it's just a protective mechanism against stuff. But when I look back now, for a long time, that's what was driving me. Even when I, even when I started becoming successful in fitness, I like I, n I never really dealt with that. Um, and it was it was what led to also, I, you know, I certainly believe that's what led to my divorce and what led to a lot of other things in my life that kind of fell apart is this search for significance, you know what I mean? I gotta have this, yeah. I gotta be, I, you know, hey, I make a ton of money, like, hey, you know, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, you know? Um, and I think ego is natural, but if it gets out of control, that's what happens. And I try to, you know, kind of fulfill something empty inside of me by, uh, you know, either selling drugs and having money or even just like, I mean, I, I can even remember as, you know, like I'd have a girlfriend when I was younger and, and, and it's like, you try to hide stuff, but it's just like, hey, hey, baby, I just gotta, um, I just gotta make a quick stop, you know, and it's yeah. like, take out the 20 grand of the code and we walk out, huh, what's that, oh my God. You know what I mean? Like, dude, this is all like shit that we do to make ourselves feel better, you know? Now, how and, much of it was you being rebellious against maybe what your mom expected or wanted? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. I mean, I mean, what is rebellion, right? Like, rebellion is, is, is like us and, you know, us and them, like separation, mm -hmm. like, well, you're like this and I'm here, I'm different, I'm, right? And that's, I think different is another, another yeah. kind of good I mean, to this day, that's one of the things you and I have com in common and always drives us, like, we want to be doing what everyone else isn't doing or trying to just, like, you, you're not gonna, even if it's guaranteed, you're not gonna go into it. Uh, no, and I don't think you it's a bad thing. You gotta your own path. No, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that, like, you know, uh, I had a client, um, Amy Africa, back in the day, and she said, look, you know, you got these boxes you plug your energy into. And he's like, man, you had a box that was like a criminal box, you know? And then you took that, like, and this, and this was like wired like a motherfucker, right? And you pulled it out and then you had to put it somewhere else. And you put it into, you know, basketball and fitness, right? And then now it's like, now this box still lives. Now what I mean by this is, okay, like if somebody came and was like, hey Luca, we got a, a, a ton of shipment of coke, like we need to get it, you know, here, there, and the other, like payouts this much, right? And most people would be like, what? The f what? My brain will still go like, oh, maybe we could, and I'm like, oh, what am I doing, right? But it's, but it's like, because it's that underlying, you know what I mean, pattern of like the same thing, alcoholism or, or, or whatever else, like you have to fight these things. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, shit, I have stories where I was still like, I was like doing well, and I, I would literally for a moment lapse and be like, you know, making deals on like criminal stuff. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? And I, I would literally have to stop myself. Like, what are you doing, dude, right? And so it's like the more good that you do, the more of a new pattern you have, the more you override that old pattern. But it's still there, you know. What I mean, so that's why alcohol and I'm uh, AA is like, hey, don't have a drink again, right? Like, yep. um, but what, what ended up happening is at a certain point in time, and I know I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but I think this is important. At a certain point in time, you know, I never looked at myself in the mirror and felt good about that, right? You don't come home and go like, sell 120 pills today, mm. you know, like, hey, I just robbed that. Like, you don't, you just don't, right? So, so obviously there's some type of shame and guilt around that too. And there was a certain point in time where I was like, man, like, you know, I want to tip the scales, whether you fucking want to call it karma or you want to call it, you know, God or the universe or whatever it is for anybody else. Like for me, it was just like maybe good and bad, the scale of good and bad, who am I in this world? And I was like, man, I really want to tip this scale that when I leave this earth, I've, it's this, the scale is so far tipped on the good side and I help people and I make people's lives better. And I, I had this daily, like legitimate, like this purpose to do that. I felt bad about like, I'm like, man, is like this really who I'm gonna be? You know, like, or I'm gonna tell the story of like, how I fucking, you know, did this cool thing selling dope. Like, you know, that, and that's what I think attracted me to fitness because like even when I was playing pro and I started training people and I didn't make any money from it, the feeling that I would get after I would help someone or like when people like, yo, that was a dope obsession, man. And like they would start, you know, texting me and going like, man, like, hey, I'm stronger. Like things that other people would never do before. It gave me, I mean, it was like an addiction. It was a high, right? It was a, ple it was a pleasure and I wanted more of that pleasure. And I, and I could connect that and go like, hey, you know what, when I do that and I go home and look at myself and I feel good about myself. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned. Like if we broke it down, you know, I went to college, you know, obviously to play ball, but I did, you know, I did business management. I did, I did minor in exercise science and kinesiology, but it was like, I learned marketing and accounting and, and 95% of what I learned was business shit, yeah. you know? And, but I was like, man, I, I think I had an advantage because 
I was doing, when you talk about supply and demand and you talk about marketing and connecting with clients, I mean, it so sounds crazy, mm -hmm. man, but I was, you know, I was the, I was the neighborhood drug dealer that was like, cool. Like, I wasn't threatening you and stuff. I was like, cool with everybody. I was doing the same shit I'm doing here. Yeah. But it's like, now I'm selling something that like actually tr really, truly does transform people's lives. But I was already doing it then, right? And so when it, when it came to, for me to do anything, like my brother's like, I'm going to Brazil, uh, you know, run my company. Like, I, I would make that shit happen. And now I'm running, you know, selling transla translation services. My dad's like, hey, I want you to oversee the project management of this uh, cross frame table for a big company, that, that uh, design company in England. I'm driving out doing that while I'm doing two practices a day. I mean, like, I did, you know, I worked in warehouses, you know, and, and, and had the most chips put into the fucking Epson printers, right? Like, I took these virtues and put them into all these other areas. And so it's, it, I, I just think that, like, it just depends on where you put it. They're not, you know, trying to stand out. It's not a bad thing, you know, um, being different, you know, uh, trying to attain power if you use it for good. Not a bad thing, right? Yep. All good things. I just think it's like, where do you plug it? Where do you plug it in? You know what I mean? And um, I don't regret any of it. I mean, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm proud of some things, but I also go like, well, what if you took those things away? It, am I the Luca that I am today? And, right, right and, for us. Oh man, and it's like, here, even five, probably about five years ago, I'm never saying this on camera. Like, I'm, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm, I'm feeling guilty and shameful about uh, cheating, yeah. uh, you know, selling drugs, you know, putting, you know, uh, pointing a gun at somebody, like all these different things. Like I would, I would never share them. But the thing is, these are like, these are the lessons that I think that help people transform more. Cause it's like, you know, and I've had people like judge me personally, oh man, you did that. And I'm like, yeah, but that's who I was. Like now I'm here. The, like what you, what I would like for you to consider is like the transformation and that, that shows other, you know, that's why I like love working with kids and the scholarship program we're starting because, you know, the kids are like, well, what do you know? And I'm like, ah, let me tell you a story, right? Okay. And they go like, oh shit. But now the wisdom is coming from a place of where I understand you. Like, man, I was there. I understand where you're coming from. Like, I get you. Like, I don't even think you're an idiot or you're stupid. Like other people might tell you that you are. But let me, like, let me paint you a different picture and a perspective and consider it. You know, just suspend your disbelief for a second right here. You know, and then, I, and then slowly you can start, you know, changing your mind. But if you're coming in with like, oh, this is my background, you're a dumbass. Like, this is not good for you. Fucking nobody's listening to that, right? So you use your scars, you use your story, you use your, your pain, you use your, the challenges uh, and, and share the lessons and the wisdoms and that's what helps people transform. And I think that, you know, uh, I, I, was, I was talking to Dax Boy one time and somebody asked him, because, you know, Dax used to, at least used to train like princes and mm -hmm. celebrities and all these different things, you know. Uh, and I mean, one, one piece of advice was a good piece of advice and said, how do you get those people to coach with you? Like, you know, do you have to be the best trainer? And it's like, well, no, man, like you actually, you have to be interesting too. Like they have to be able to have conversations with you yeah. that matter. And so to do that, you have to do shit. Mm -hmm. You have to travel and read and, mm -hmm. and, and go to, you know, seminars and lessons and do stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and say, like, look, go sell a bunch of dope so you have a story. Yeah. But, but it means like, hey, like put yourself out there. Yeah. Risk, experience, live life. You know what I mean? Because now you have more to share, right? Versus yeah, nobody wants to read a book about a guy who just gets up and goes to work every day and does the same no, thing at no. That's what I'm saying, dude. Yeah. Um, I mean, should, dude, if, I, if I told you, look, you play video games, right? Mm -hmm. When you're younger, right? If I gave you a video game, I said, listen, grab this controller. All you gotta fucking do is press this green button and just press forward, and you get through the game, you win. You'd be like, dude, get the fuck out of here. I'm not playing that game. Game sucks. The game yeah. sucks. But you go, you know, like you go in and 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 you get to the boss. Boss kills you. Fuck. You come back. Boss kills you. Boss kills you. Seventh time, you beat the boss, you get the extra life, the supercharger, whatever, right? Guess what? There's another boss. This is life. You know what I mean, I think I think that life is inherently a game, and the goal is to get the best at playing the game of life, right? And and if people looked at it, and uh, and I, I was home for you know I was home for Christmas and playing video games with the kids, you know, and I think it was my nephew that was like I was playing like Call of Duty or some shit like that, you know, and I'm I'm playing the game, and I'm like, yo, where are you going? Let's 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 complete this level. He's like, oh, I'm going where the explosions are at. That's where, that's where all the fun is at. That's where you get better. I had to pause the game because I was like, man, that's like some deep wisdom right there, right? <laughs> like, why would you just go through the game just to get through the game? Yeah. Where he's like, no, no, this is where the challenge and the fun is, and this is where I get better. Huh. So when I take on something, you know, like, I mean, I was at home 
you know, like uh, some day nights crying, like, do I, you know, I, I, I made a good life for myself. I, I you know, I'm, I'm secure with money and this, that, and the other. Like, do I go buy this building, which had every, you know, every shit show waiting to happen. And, but I was like, okay, but what's pulling me? Like, what's pulling me is this bigger vision, this legacy, this risky thing, right? This new boss. And, and, I, and I took it, you know, and I put, I mean, literally, like I risked everything that I built mm. to that, that point in time into this. But the thing is, but now I'm beating that boss. You know what I mean? Like, and trust me, we had a lot of bosses uh, that I failed at, you know, sometimes every day, sometimes every week. But, but now I'm playing the fuck, I feel like I'm playing a game. I'm alive, you know, even if everything were to fall apart, I ask myself like, man, if everything goes to shit, like, can I live with that because I went after it? And one, can I rebuild it because of the hustle, the heart, and the, the, the knowledge that I've attained, right? And and to me, it's like, that's always gonna be the question. Like there is, you know, it sounds foo-foo, but there's something that's pulling you. And I can't get up in the morning to work for another 50 grand or another 100 grand. Like that doesn't, that does not like excite me. Not to say that I don't wanna be financially better off, but only if that money is coming from the work that I do that fulfills like this, you know, North Star that I'm chasing. And, and like I said, like for, for people that are there, they'll understand. For people that are not, like I encourage you to keep working because purpose isn't found. It's forged through fucking, you know, the, the fires of, of hard work and finding yourself through doing stuff. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, and, and you get to that point where you start going like, and fuck another 10 grand. Like, you know, I work for four years making zero more, but then down the line, because I'll do great work for people and change their lives, I'll make an extra million or whatever, right? Like, um, and so that's my mentality, and I know it kind of loops back to, you know, how, how I feel about my, my past. Um, but it's also what, you know, it, every single one of those things took me to the next thing. To get away from doing what I was doing, because things were getting like very, let's just say spicy, um, you know, I ended up making the decision to go to college, and, and it happened through uh, when I went to Eastern Invitational Basketball, uh, it was like the Basketball Academy in Jer uh, Trenton, New Jersey, we went with the team, with our Slovenian team. Um, did really well there. And the coach, you know, one of the guys that was, was coaching my team, Wayne Jones, was like, have you ever thought about going to college in the States? And I was like, eh, not, not really. I'm gonna go pro, I'm pro, like I'm already pro, like I'm the guy, blah, 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 right? He's like, all right, just, you know, think about it, man. Like, so this was my last year, essentially, kind of, actually, I was out of high school, because I went to high school early. And uh, all I was doing was playing ball and like working. And uh, that year, shit went like, I was also still selling dope and a lot of it. and. A lot of things happen from, you know, all of a sudden I'm starting to see like pages of like reports with mic phone conversations, like word for word what I was saying. So oh, we were wow. bugged and, you know, uh, and, and like people were getting robbed. I was getting threatened. I mean, like by, you know, people that you have to pay attention to mm -hmm. and like fucking now, now all of a sudden, it's, you know, I'm looking over my shoulder all the time. And so throughout that year, Wayne kept in touch with me, said, look, man, fly out to Denver, train with me for two weeks. Let's go back to Eastern and like, you know, have your best round, dude, and like you could get, you know, a scholarship. And I ended up doing that. And, uh, you know, this is end of July is where we're, we're back in New Jersey for two weeks back to back. I play great. Um, I get Western Michigan, Quinnipiac, uh, Delaware State. They're all like, man, we love your game. Um, and we, we would love to you to come on board. But of course, I, I know nothing about college scholarships at this point in time. I'm like, great, what do I do, right? It's like, well, you know, there's no more scholarships this year. You gotta, you gotta walk on. Fuck it, I'll walk on. And it's like, okay, every one of those schools is like 40,000 plus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my dad's like, yep, yeah, no bueno. Um, and so one of the coaches that year said, listen, man, like, you know, I, I, I played and then coached at a school in upstate New York. Uh, he's like, man, you can't get a full ride. It's, it's, it's like it's a D2 and so on and so forth. But, you know, you can get some money and it's cheap and it's like, but you'll play. And I came back August 3rd and basically like August 3rd, I came back, started doing the paperwork, embassy, the whole shebang. Uh, couldn't go out earlier than September 11th and September 11th. So I made this like life decision, fuck it, I'm out, you know, uh, in a very, very short amount of time. Flew out on September 11th, on the September 11th. Crazy. And uh, my flight was supposed to land uh, 20 hours, uh, sorry, not 20 hours, like uh, 40 minutes, 40 minutes after the towers got hit um, in New York. We flew around until we ran out of gas and then landed in, uh, in Nova Scotia. And I was in Nova Scotia in a military camp for a week, then drove to, uh, then drove to upstate New York to Binghamton. That was the beginning of my, my kind of my college career. St was there for two years, went to Southern Virginia for two, full ride. Um, and from there ended up going to play pro overseas. So 
I mean, and, and like I said, there, there's so many underlying stories that sometimes you know people are like that's a lot of shit going on. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's been a it's been a full, uh, yeah. full life, right? A very colorful life, but um. But every single one of those, because I've had so, like, even through that process, so many failures that I can't even, you know, I got let down so much because I wanted to go D1. And it's like, oh, you, you couldn't go D1. So now I'm in junior college, not even D1 Juco, Juco. Then I went to D2 NAIA school, you know, versus like, hey, I'm better than this. I could play in the NBA, you know, worked through that. Did, you know, was the all conference, all region team, all these different things. Uh, you know, then thought nothing was going to happen. Hustle my balls off. Uh, played NBA Summer Pro League, then you know, then went to play in Ukraine, you know, uh, which was a really good team. Everything was on up and up. Uh, you know, didn't know anything about, didn't even have, a, uh, didn't have an agent then. Uh, you know, left that team. Actually, got replaced by Rodney Buford from the Sixers. Uh, I'm with no team. Signed for Kudka. You know, played for Kudka. Don't don't get paid my last three months of the contract because the team was without money. Uh, ended up playing my last year of pro ball, literally not getting paid almost a whole year, right? Practicing twice a day, two and a half yeah. hours a day, coaching people in between. Um, I mean, it's like if you, you know, wrote the list of it, it was just like failure, 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 failure. Um, identity crisis, you know, when I decided to to not continue ball anymore while I was like, man, this fitness thing, like I, I feel something for it. I just don't want to be, like I never, I just never wanted to be good at something. You know, I could continue to play ball. I got an offer from, you know, Portugal for Division Two. At that point in time, I was, I was, uh, I was married, and I'm like, do I want to, you know, hey, go to Portugal with me, and then after this year, maybe we'll go to Belgium and Germany. Yeah. You know, I didn't even want that. It wasn't even about just her. I didn't want that for myself, right? I just wanted to be, like, I want to do something. That I'm going to be the best in the fucking world at, you know. And um, no matter what you say, like in ball, there is some restrictions. Yep. Like, like height and whatever. You know, and I, I think, I mean, I, I made it further than anybody else by, by pure fucking hard work and will. I mean, and you still go back, you know, back home and ask people and, and you got, you know, uh, my friend was a scout for the Portland Blazers. He was the national team uh, coach for under 20. And, uh, you know, a lot of these guys, and you'll go like, hey, listen, man, who's who's the hardest working person you ever, you know, like, oh, man, there's this one guy, he's a nutcase, you know, the host yeah. of our, and, you know, so I do, I think you can overcome a lot of the things that you don't have with just pure fucking work. You know, I mean, there really is nothing else, you know what I mean? Um, and, and Talk so, about the decision to hang it up. Was that tough for you to say I'm not, I'm not going to play ball anymore? It, 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 abs it absolutely was um, tough. I, like fitness helped me, right? So there was. Yeah. I, I, what so you were I, kind of excited about going into the next thing what, at that what, point. I, yeah, and it's like I realized, you know, that like I started lifting weights when I was 14. My mom opened the gym. Um, uh, I don't think I, I've shared this in a couple of places, but she basically would work in the bank and with her friend open a gym. She'd work. You know, come home at like four, be at the gym at four, four thirty-five, and then work till like eleven. And there's this like fifteen hundred square foot gym at the top of a. It's this building called Part Partizan. It was like in Slovenia, you'd have like you know physical education facilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so she got the spot there. And what was cool is that I got like mentored by a, a national power lifter. Um, There's two guys that were like literally world class, like gold medalist uh, in the Olympics. They were winning medals like on the horse. So Eliash Bigan and like they were doing gymnastics. And they, they had a little shitty gym at the bottom, but they were like world champions. And they would come up and lift huh. and I talked to them. Wow. Um, and so, you know, and, and when I started lifting weights, weights made me become the strong kid in the basketball court, right? Because yeah. I was like, you know, and it's like it helped me jump higher. And like I started going like, oh shit, this is dope, you know? And, and so I got hooked on that. So there was this underlying story of me and fitness that starts like really early. And, um, you know, I would train by the time I was 16, I would go and, um, you know, I bugged my coach and I was like, hey man, like I wanna get faster, I wanna jump higher, I gotta dunk it, I gotta do this, that, and the other. And so he went to, he knew this guy, his name was uh, Sergeant George, fucking hard to say, but he trained uh, Marilyn Adi in her later days. So we're talking about this guy trained Olympians, right? Like top track and field coach. And the guy was like, man, like, you know, if this kid, you know, it's kind of like, a, like if his kids wants to come early in the morning at fucking 6.30, whatever, man, you can train with us. Yeah. There I am, you know, every fucking, I mean, every morning, like two, three days a week, I'm showing up before school and I'm training, you know, and I'm learning. I mean, I'm talking about, I'm learning from the top guy, mm. you know, in probably not just Slovenia, like the Balkans on speed development and like CNS and like all this stuff and like, you know, sled pulls and like plyos and I'm doing all this stuff, right? And um, I was reading, I mean, I was reading, I read the speed trap when I was like, I don't know, fucking 17. I was reading Verkhoshansky and Zatsursky and Tudor Bomp and Mel Sif. 
not because I wanted to be a strength coach, it's because I just wanted to be better. I, I wanted wow. to have the unfair advantage over yeah. other players, you know? And that spurred this kind of educational, like, you know, in school you're made to read, but in, you know, and I didn't want to read, right? Yeah. Dostoevsky and fucking write essays, but, but then when I was able to read, you know, uh, like T Nation and Elite FTS, I'm like, dude, that's why that's why I found out about you first, and like Cressy and, and Mike Robertson. I I'd, I'd read at one point in time, I know I read 3,500 articles on those two sites, Damn. and then bought everything there was to buy, every product, every everything. I was yeah. obsessed, but I'm not like I'm not thinking about that because I'm you know I'm like I want to be the best basketball player, I want to be in the NBA. But that's where all this started. It's also why I took exercise can as a minor because I was not because I wanted to have it. It's because, oh shit, like we're gonna go through anatomy. Uh, we're gonna learn this and mm. PT and like all these. You know, our athletic trainer at VI was uh, played for the Bulls. You know, before he became became that. So like for me, it was just like, how can I learn? How can I learn? How can I learn? So that underlying story, you know, kind of led to, I was always the guy that people would ask for, hey, Luca, man, how do I get stronger? You know, when I was in college, because I was always in the fucking weight room, you know, weight room, shooting shots, doing my drills. And so there was this this story behind that. And when, um, you know, I, I was kind of like found out about Pavel like really long time ago, early 2000s, started doing kettlebell training. Um, and this was all like, man, I want to get better at ball, I want to get better at ball. And so, even though there was like when I started going like I, I don't know if I want to continue with ball I love it but also you know the the pro side of things really dampened my passion for it mm -hmm. because yeah. it becomes so um, you know you think about it man like you're getting crushed the coach would talk shit you're not even getting paid you know the culture of teams wasn't the way that I wanted to but I was playing street ball like I, I was in the Nike Battlegrounds finals like I mean I was literally one of the top if I mean I'm gonna say I was the top one but you know one one players in the country I was loving it you know not getting paid much or anything it was just like the passion as soon as I'd go to the team you know bickering this that the other you know and I think that kind of made me go fuck man do I really want this you know the way that I used to yeah um and so then there is definitely this like because at that point in time the person training industry is pretty much almost non-existent in our country uh, I'm training people. I'm actually writing programs for our basketball team, uh, helping my brother with the soccer team, like all this stuff, right? And I'm really good at it. Like I really like understand this stuff, right? And um, but at the same time, I'm like, well, I can't. Really, I don't know if I can make money here. Like, who am I if I'm not this person that like for the last 15 years dedicated like every waking fucking moment almost in my life to this sport, right? And um, so that it's, was. It's a, hard to lose your identity. Oh, it, for sure. It, it, so I mean, it, it's hard to explain. I remember when I was even like uh, Aaron back then flew out to Ukraine, and when I was let go, right? Of course, like I mean, you think about like working so hard, making it like, oh man, this is about to be great, you know. And at the point in time when you get let go, NBA player comes to replace you. It's like, man, am I worth it? Like, man, am I ever gonna make it? You know, I mean, there's, there's so many things, and in, in uh, sport is so volatile, right? Like, where you get injured, you're doing great, you're out for six months. People don't want to smell you. Wow, that guy's injury prone, paying 50% mm -hmm. less. Yep. You know, you got one season at the end of the season, unless you're fucking LeBron or some like, you know, there's a small percentage of people that are like, wow, you can do whatever. Um, but even those guys, man, if they're out for two seasons, like, right? I mean, it's very, very volatile and people don't see that. And it's tough, you know, the, the season ends, I got no contract. Man, agent, hustling, talking to coaches. I'll go to trial anywhere, fucking fly here, fly here, fly there. I mean, it's, it is a is a challenging life, of, full of uncertainty. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm so glad that I made the decision that I did because I see people that I used to play with that were legends, you know. And now I'm like, man, like I feel bad almost because they they played for so long because they, they they didn't want to face what other life there is. That now it's just like I'll play anywhere for anything, um, you know, no savings, no this, no that, and it's just like you hate to see people that were influenced you or like you were inspired by to be that way you know and and for me that was like that point where i was like i don't want to be that like i don't want to be be like hey remember when i could dunk it and when i played but rather like create something that helps people so i can tilt that scale that i was talking about before and you know create a legacy and it's like the feeling that i got you know and and, and when i look back like i was always the guy like so uh the irony of it is giga which i mentioned to you like he's a uh um the friend of mine that like runs the facility in Slovenia is, is Giga, my friend Marco, who also played ball with me, my brother and another guy Gregor. So, like, we were we, they called us the Bulldogs, right? Because we would we'd always lift weights and we play D so hard that people were just fucking scared of us, you know. And and you look at that and you go like, 
man, it was always there. Like that was our thing. We would get everybody riled up. Like people that didn't want to lift weights would fucking start lifting weights because we would like just go ape shit. You know, it was just like crazy, right? Like we had that already back then. And I realized that like I had this thing inside of me that was a leadership thing and it was getting people fired up and inspired and I really knew my shit. But I never allowed it to grow because of this. And you know, we talked about the fuck your dream, right? Like part of it was like, hey Luca, fuck your basketball dream, man. Like this is this is who you're meant to be, you know yeah. what I mean? But I think you gotta find that. You don't you don't find that shit sitting on the couch. I had to go through, you know, basketball gave me so much. It gave me discipline, work ethic communication with team uh you know teamwork like all these different things that that now you know people go like oh man how do you work so hard dude i've been working this hard since i can remember right. you know it becomes who you are it's not what you do it becomes who you are and, and and that's the thing is like i see so many people i'm sure like you get the question like jay how do i find my purpose jay you know how do i do this that and the other and i'm like you will not find it unless you work your fucking ass off and you might have to do it as something you don't even like but that's going to lead you to something that you understand that you love better. You yep. know what I mean? You can't sit there and go like, hmm, I'm really passionate about this, now I'm gonna jump into this, right? And so I, when I look back, it's like there is no vigor ground without the failures, without the basketball, without the drugs, without the, you know, everything else that, that happened. And, and I, you know, everybody has their story and everybody's story is amazing, right? I mean, you have your scars, you have your stuff, and it's like, that's what makes you who you are. It's like the scars of, you know, kings and queens, man. Like, it's the foundation. And so, use that, and just know that every, at any fucking point in time, you can change that story and write a new story. Because I did, I've, I've, I've written it over and over again. You've written it over and over again, man. Like, you know, and, and it's like, today, if we go, like, we keep talking, like, I do, we're gonna, you know, do this and that and the other. Yeah, like, we're basically sitting down and we're directing our own script of our fucking life. And there's nothing that can stop you and me from going like, all right, let's go do this. Now, it might take five years longer than we want, mm -hmm. or it might to be, you know, be 10 times more money or effort or whatever, and 100 times more failures. But if we want to go and you know, complete that script and make that movie, we can do it. You know what I mean? Like P Pixar does, uh, <laughs> they said Pixar does 19 like, or something like that, rewrites of the whole fucking movie, right? Yep. right? Because the first one is shit. So the one you see, you go like, you know, I just saw the Incredibles, oh, it's phenomenal, right? Well, at the beginning, that was a complete piece of shit, right? And, but they had to rewrite it. The problem is that most people, they rewrite, they try to redo it one time, the second time, third yeah. time, like, ah, Give up. it's not for me, yeah. right? But the thing is like, man, you wanna do it, rewrite it 18 fucking times, and you have a masterpiece. And it's gonna take longer than you think. It's gonna be harder than you think. You're gonna hurt, it's gonna be pain. You know what I mean? All that stuff, and it's like, without it, honestly, you wouldn't even appreciate it. Like, if you told me what you wanted today, and I fucking gave it to you, you'd be like, oh, great. Yeah. Right? It's done. Like, next day you probably fuck it up because it doesn't matter to you. When I sold dope, I would make the money. Dude, I would like, I could, I could burn it and not feel anything. Like, ah, let's go, whatever, right? Man, I worked in a warehouse the whole summer, like crazy. Even while I was ma making dope money, I didn't touch that. Because mm, that money was like, right. no, 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 no. Dude, I remember what I did yeah, for that yeah, shit, yeah. right? And so it's the same here now. Like, I work really hard for everything that I have. But I'm like, okay, like where I'm gonna put this because I worked hard for it. Let me create something more from it, right? Versus just like, yeah. and that's the thing is when people get it easy, it's actually the the worst thing that can happen to you mm -hmm. is that you that you fucking have it easy. It's the worst thing that can happen to oh. you. So when you have it hard, man, get excited, get excited. That's that's like now it's like when shit gets hard, I sit down and I'm like, all right, this is gonna be a great story. It's gonna be you know. Nobody's having it this hard. I want it to be harder because then nobody's going to go through this. I'm going to go through this and they're not, you know? And, and so you use all of this stuff as a competitive advantage and to drive you in the direction of that, you know, that North Star, I think. All right, so we are here at the original spot that you opened up in 2008. Yep, 2000, 2008. Yeah. My timeline gets so fucked up, but it's yeah. 2008. Because yeah. I know it was in a recession. Um, thousand square feet. Thousand square feet, uh, 111 Burnett Avenue South. Uh, I mean, shit, I wish, because right now it's like, it's a, it's a car garage, which is yeah. what it was before that. I kind of wish it was, was open so you could see, um, I mean, this place was, it was rugged, man, but it's like, the, you know, we put the graffiti in and it yeah. had its own feel. I also had some black mold, uh, which now I can say on camera, <laughs> yeah. probably, because you know, I, mean? I was wiping that shit down. Like, with, um, But I think people got like really, really good health from immunity to adaptation <laughs> right, right, to right. that. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's but, why you never get sick. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but yeah, this was, I mean, this was the first gym in, in, in America, right? Because we started in, actually we went from the woods 
to a small space in Slovenia before I moved here. Mm -hmm. And then obviously that that gym over there had its, its own journey is now, you know, I, I would say, I mean, I would say it's recognized as the number one kind of like functional training gym as much as I hate that word um, in the country. But when I came here, I had to start from scratch, big box gyms, and this was this was the first spot. But dude, this was, there was dude, for, the, for the three years that we were here, there was no signs. Like I never put a sign up. I never, so like people would be like in front of here going like, what the fuck is this gym? And I'd, yeah. and I'd roll up the door like, hey, what's up, man? <laughs> and yeah. they'd be like, you know, some people would be like, what the fuck is going on, you know, suspect. Right. But this was it, man. Like this became like a, a, a cult, mm. a cult gym. It was like all graffiti inside. We did all graffiti. Um, Shit, I still got pictures and stuff, but it's like, it goes. I've seen like, pictures of it. And it's like, and it has like, there's no, basically there's no, um, there's like too many bathrooms, like Superman bathrooms, like, you know what I mean? You gotta change yeah. and shit. Uh, it's, it's really not a bathroom. It's just like a door and there's a, there's a toilet, that's it. And then I had a table in the back. It was it was long and it kind of had a dividing wall, but it wasn't really a divide. It was still open. Yeah. Uh, so we did like, there was no turf, dude. I couldn't afford turf, so we yeah. had carpet. Right. Like right. straight sure. up fucking black carpet. Yeah. And then mats, and then I got I had um four or five grand worth of like the stuff I brought from like LA Fitness and Vision Quest. Yeah. I put it in here, and then we got like a super old used rack, like str like the. So so wait so so prior to opening this in 2008, you were just training people around here. At, I was training out of two big box gyms. Uh, first LA Fitness, uh, and then from there I went to this place called Vision Quest, yeah. which ended up. Uh, I helped them like develop a lot of stuff there. Like, uh, I think we were, I, I guarantee we we're the first big box gym where I was like, hey, let's do boot camps, but let, let's put them on EFT, so on recurring revenue uh, inside okay. of a big box gym. Mm. And they said, that's no way. Yeah. So you're, basically, you're saying we're gonna, somebody's going to pay 19 bucks, and then you're saying pay 95 on top of that? Yeah. For two boot camps a week? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, that's not going to work. And I was like, it'll work. <laughs> and it worked. And then what happened? Because 2008 was the recession, right? Like, but wait, uh, so how did you do it? Like, you were charging the, the gym, 99? No, no, the, the gym, gym was. was. I just, I ended up getting, like, I made a deal with, with Chip then. We kind of okay. got a little, I got a percentage of it. Yeah. You know, they didn't, part of it was too, like, ah, this guy's kind of crazy, but all right, I'm let's see what happens, right? Yeah. And uh, I think we opened with, like, 60 people in it, man. And then it kept growing. But see, the thing is, what they did is, in the recession, they killed it. They were buying out gyms for pennies on the dollar, ended up getting to 14 mm. gyms, sold to LA Fitness for like 40 million, 39 million, something like that yeah. over time. But but so I went from LA Fitness to Vision Quest and I was at Vision Quest while I opened this. Okay. Right? So I would come in here in the morning, I'd be, you know, I'd get up at 445, I have a 545, you know, boot camp, uh, run another one, train a couple people, head out to Vision Quest, start there at like eight or nine, do a 12 hour day of training come back here, train myself, train athletes, wow. study, write blog posts, go to sleep at two, wake up at 4.45. And I did that for a long time. You're still doing yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of, so, I mean, kind of, sort of. I'm doing it, I'm doing it with, while, while still doing the sleep, but then. So wait, let me ask you, so, so, so in 2008, when you had that vision, of, like we're gonna pull all these people on EFT, because now I, I know you read 50 business books a week, but like, <laughs> was that the same, was that the case back then? Or what was your um, level of like, I, were you well, going to a bunch of business workshops and yeah, reading a ton I was, of books I was still? already, like, when I was still in Slovenia, just to give a little bit of, like, we started our first gym in Slovenia, I think 12 years ago now. Okay. So like about 12 years ago. Yeah. Uh, something like that. And, uh, and it was just a room and whatnot. But I was already, like, back then, I was playing, you know, I was playing pro ball. Yeah. Like, my, when my brother would go to Brazil, I'd run this translation agency. And I was like, hey, listen, man, don't, don't pay me. Just pay for this. Uh, uh, it was called... Trainers Inner Circle, it's like Pat Rigsby's thing, right? Okay. And then I did Bootcamp Blueprint. So I was already like, I was like, yeah, whatever, man. I'll, I'll just, just use that money, pay for my bunch of education. And so I was learning about recurring revenue, right? And, and in Slovenia, there's no way you could ever do that, by the way. Uh, we, we had a tough time uh, two years ago getting uh, recurring billing going in the gym. It's wow. still difficult, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. But we have it now. So I learned about that, right? And it's, but everywhere you'd go, yeah, gyms would have it, like other stuff would have it, but personal training businesses back then were right. just like sessions, sessions, sessions. And, um, and and I was like, man, we gotta start changing that. And uh, you know, I, literally within four months of opening my spot, I, I started doing recurring. Um, and it was a little bit of a transition because everybody was so used to in personal training. Totally, boot yeah. Boot camps, just like pay and then pay again. Yeah. And then the four weeks is over, the six weeks is over, pay again, whatever, right? Um, which is the worst. Which is the worst ever, ever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and it's like, and, it, and you know, here was what was happening. The first four months, I was, uh, I had people on recurring billing, 
but I was running everybody through PayPal myself. Uh, okay. So I, got, I remember when we got to like 70 people here or something like that. Yeah. And every month I'm like, fuck. Because then I'd have to sit down and run 70 people, like the address, right. everything, right? It was massively just, just stressful. Yeah. You know, like when, when I played ball in Europe, it was like, here's your contract, we're gonna promise you this, but then you wouldn't get the money. It's like, hey. So, you know, the only thing would matter is like, when does it really actually go through? Um, but we were doing things, you know, we're probably, I, I think we're, we're the first gym that we're doing semi-private training. And, you know, I got that from Alan Cosgrove way back in the day, did his uh, mentorship program. And I remember the first time we ran a Groupon, those were the days where it was like three, you know, you had three days. Remember it was like the countdown, Groupon yeah. would run a, a promo. And it was like countdown, you know, get it for crazy, like 70% off. Yeah. And then they shut it down. And I remember the first time we ran it, we got 360 people to buy. Right? Are you serious? And wow. so, so it's like, it's just me, by the way, right? The first two days, I, I didn't sleep at all. Um, I was answering, I remember the first day I answered 120 calls, emailed 85 people, and I still had 120 voicemails. Yeah. So it was just like, I couldn't even keep up with it. And so people were like, ah, you know, it's just Jim, nobody's getting back to you. And I was like, dude, I'm fucking by myself, running everything all yeah. day long. Um, and it, and it was a very kind of polarizing thing because I was a nutcase. Um, like we, we do like these uh, orientations. Yeah. And I mean, you know, people are bringing kids. I was cursing, doing ninja kicks. So half the people are like, "Fucking no way, I'm coming here." So yeah, I, I kind of love the story that you were doing everything because I think there's a huge misconception nowadays when people are starting out and they're like, "Oh well, I'm gonna outsource everything," and or they just try to take the easy way where it's like, oh, "You you're not gonna sleep." For like the first two no, or three no, years, dude, and you have to do everything. Like, how are you going to outsource and pay people? Like, you didn't have the money to do it. You don't you have you the money. You got to do everything. You're answering the phone. You're cleaning the toilet. You're trying. Absolutely. When you can afford to do it, yeah, bring somebody in. But even then, though, like, see, this this is the thing. This is the misconception. Though. Even then, people go like, "Well, if you have the money, let me just start it off right away." Yeah. But here's the thing: How do you then know what's good and what's not good? Right. Right. Like, because it's your business, you know. I, I try to really like care for everybody. Yeah. The high fives, the hugs, the like really paying attention to stuff, right? Like. Yeah, and you and, do that better than anyone. And, and it's, yeah. but it's but it's like that's at the core of like the belief system of what I think people should get, right? Sure. Like, and and just like how I think people should be treated. Now, if you start the business and go like, cool, okay, I'm coaching, but fuck it, like I'm gonna give away, uh, you know, you're gonna answer the calls, you're gonna answer this, you're gonna do that. Yeah. Do those people have those same value systems as you do? Yeah. And if they don't, they won't behave the same way. And so then that becomes a reflection of your business. And right now is a big thing in fitness business, I think, that we're dealing with because, you know, you got the lead gen company. It's like, hey, dude, we'll bring you in leads, right? But what do those people think about you? What, what happens when you step through? What happens even when the phone gets picked up? Mm. You know, is it like, hey, Gary. All right, which, which, you know, it's like, dude, was it like, hey, what's going on, man? I'm so excited to, like, hear from you. Hey, I heard that, you know, I read your, I read your application for, man. Hey, you love basketball, too? I do, too. What's your favorite team? Like, just shit that's just, like, at the core of who we are as human beings. And, it, and so I don't give a shit if you get 120 leads a, m a month. I mean, first of all, like, what do you, like, what if only 20 people sign up? What happened with the other 100? Where they like, man, that was horrible service. You know, they didn't call me back, They're, right? And these are all these things that people don't think about. And they just think, well, if I get them through the door, then that's all that matters. If I get this application, there's so much more to it. And I think when you start a business, you know, like when I did here where everything was just like, I mean, it was chaos, right? But guess what? Like I learned about like, hey, what it is to call 100 people a day mm -hmm. and answer 80 emails. And uh, the first time I, I was like, I think it'd be great if I gave them folders, right? <laughs> and fucking 60 people show up. I spent 1400 bucks on creating these folders sure. with everything in it. And I was like, well, if I do that, I'm going to go bankrupt. So I can't do that anymore. Now right. it's going to be a PDF, you know. And so it, you go through the process of actually understanding uh, because you're doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So the true wisdom of it, right? Versus, you know, oh, I'm just going to hire. Like right now, if you get a really, really good customer service rep in Seattle, you're paying 50K, right? Like, please let me know which gym, you know, at a smaller level can afford a $50,000 customer yeah, service totally. rep. Dude, like, you know, you're not gonna be paying yourself for another four years if you do that or more. So, so these, all these misconceptions, I think if you start from the ground up, what it does, it, it forces you to master your craft as a coach and it forces you to master your craft as a human being. Like, how do I communicate with people? Like, how do I, do I call people back on time? Do I get their programs on time? Do I, you know, send handwritten appreciation cards out? You know, and, and, it, and it's like, I think that you get, to me, it's the same as basketball in Europe, right? It's, thousands of reps, right? Like, instead of like, oh, you know, and one, it's like, and people go like, what's going on? 
well, man, because I did that fucking, you know, drill so many times, it just became second nature to me. Yeah. I was forced to do it. But at the same time, you know, if you don't do that, some people don't even, they don't know what they don't know. It's like the unconscious incompetence, you know what I mean? Like, you show it to them like, oh my God, I didn't even know that. Yeah, because you didn't do it. So at the, at the foundational level, I think it's good that like you develop a m multiple skills. You know, people say, totally. to, you know, uh, what, what, what's that, that saying? That, like if you're a trade, um, you try to master all the trades like you're not a master of any. But that's, that's I, I yeah, think that's- Jack of all trades. Jack of all enough. trades. But I would say that you need a foundation. Definitely. That's like movement, man. Like it's like, mm -hmm. that's like strength training. I think you need a foundation of everything before you can go, all right, now I'm gonna be more niche and go this and that mm -hmm. direction. It's, it, it's like, you know, people coming out of the, oh man, I understand periodization charts. I'm like, hey, what's this muscle? Oh, it's the Achilles. Yeah, you're fucked. Like you gotta know some, some foundational stuff, right? Yeah. Like, and so there's a lot of stuff going, you know, because now there's social media, which is great, right? Like you can communicate better. But these, like these basic skills, like being timely, time management, you know, knowing how to pick up the phone or, or answer an email in a way that doesn't sound, because you know, you could write an email and the person reading is like, huh? I'm never going there, right? Yeah. Just these basic skills. And you know, we were just talking about the other day, like, you know when it's templated or you know if, you know, somebody is just like, ah, you know, answering real mm -hmm. quick or they don't get back to you. I mean, and then you can go like, well, our marketing is not working. Every single gym owner I talk to, right? Nobody gets zero leads a month. They'll be like, why well, get six? I'm like, okay, cool, what are you doing with those six? Right, well, what's the numbers? Well, how many are you converting? How many are you keeping? Right, so like, let, let's look at like really basic stuff. If you get six leads, you convert four and only lose one a month. That's three new people net times 12. That's 36 new clients. If you charge two to 50, you just made 100 grand more this year, right? With only six leads, right? And you got people getting 30, 40, you know, they got ad companies running through and they're like, I don't know how we're, we're, we're not growing. And it's like, yeah, there's a much fucking deeper issue going on and you think you want to spend more money on ads or, you know, this, that, and the other, which I don't think there's nothing, anything wrong with that, but it's one piece of the puzzle. And people are like missing the foundations, right? Like you're doing uh, you're doing a, a box squat with with chains and and tendo units right now, yeah. but you can't do a body weight squat well. That's the fucking problem, right? And uh, and you're like, I don't know why my I got SI joint pain all the time. Yeah, you know. So I, I think there's massive value in man getting back down into you know what Gary Vee called like clouds and dirt, dirty work. You know what I mean? And the dirty work is not that dirty. I love it. Like you, you know, you come. This is my day, right? I'm training kids. Uh, not really getting paid much for it because I love training kids and I know they're low income and I know we're, we're going to be able to do a lot of good stuff with it. But guess what? Every time I'm doing that, I'm improving my craft. Yep. Studying the night before, I come in, I tell the story, I, I do it better. You know what yeah. I mean? And it was it's, super cool to see you doing that because I knew like you were barely getting paid doing that. These are low income kids and you're just doing it to help, doing it to get better at your craft. Because people are like, I mean, you've been doing it so long now that you could be above that, you know what I mean? It's just like, up, up in the office doing your thing, working on more important stuff. But you're in there in the trenches doing and it. And I came I back, dude. Like, like for you know, for three years, I still train people, but I was not on the schedule. Yeah. And then I, I came back on the schedule, and, and you know, and then a lot of people go like, "Oh, dude, what's what's going on?" And like, you're stressed out. It's like, you know, that. I'm like, no, dude, I I, I want to do this. I realized that. Why am I not doing the things that I love doing? Sure. You know what I mean? Like, and here, here's what happens. Like, my coaches see me do it. I'm gonna do it to the greatest of, of my abilities, and the standard's gonna be set high, and then guess what? That standard drives everybody else. Right. Right? And other thing too. Because if you're gonna ask someone to do someone, something, you have to do it first and show how, and how show you want how it done. It. Yeah. You, you cannot, you absolutely cannot. I think it's another thing that's not talked about, like business one-on-one, right? But like, you know, to, to lead others, you have to lead yourself, right? Yeah. But seriously, like, how is anybody gonna ever follow you if you go like, guys, you gotta educate yourself, and then I'm the one that never reads, never goes to anything, right? right? Now I take that stuff obsessively to the next level where, <laughs> I'm, where I'm like, you know, no. uh, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm reading a hundred books or whatever. But, but the point Five is, is that yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? But, but that's the kicker though. Like then they get inspired. Like you're yeah. seeing me train, dude. I'm training. I'm eating this way. Yep. I'm treating people this way, and I'm not fucking perfect. I drop the ball, and I admit it. But I see this a lot. People become, you know, the gym's doing great. Mm -hmm. Oh man, great, now I can be internet lifestyle. Yeah. In two years they come back, I don't know what's going on, everything's falling apart. It's like, man, this is, a, it, you know, it's, it's not B2B or B2C, it's H2H, it's human to human, right? Mm -hmm. Like, And if, if people treated it that way, uh, you know, the service businesses, I think every business, but like this even more so, like you have to be connected, you know? Like you really gotta be connected. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't get to a point. I mean, look, I, I can leave for, a month, I can leave for two weeks, I can leave for three weeks, whatever, right? Like, 
but to believe that I could just completely remove myself or that I would want to. Right? Yeah. Why would I create something that I want to remove myself with? Yeah. Not, you know, and I, well, I that's don't... the other weird misconception too, where people are like, you have to get off the gym floor. And I'm like, well, why'd you get into this business? Exactly. And I mean, maybe... like if, if I get into acting and they're like, you got to get off the set and get up into the office. <laughs> why just, you know, just be a director. And it's yeah. like, well, no, like here, here's the key. That's why I got into it. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe you go from, you know, training 60, 70 hours a week. Yeah. And you go to seven. Right. But you're still doing it, right? And, yeah. the, and the thing is too, you keep in touch. It's crazy. Like, I, you know, uh, it's funny. The other day I was talking to somebody that, Coaches business, right? And fitness, right? And we're having a conversation. I, I started realizing they have no idea what's happening with training. Mm. Like even, you know, I'm like, it, they, they'll recommend something. And I'm like, well, what about if it's a 1600 square foot gym? And they got a class like here. Yeah. And then they got athletes here and they got some people getting warmed up. And like, it was just blank. Because right. they couldn't understand the conceptually how that works, mm. right? Even program designs, right? Like I'm like, hey, here's our program, small group. And somebody's go like, well, but wouldn't it be better? I'm like, sure, it would be better. Now, if you got an hour, and I got another 40 people coming in at, at seven, I start at six, I gotta get dynamic warm-ups, ramp this, that, the other, da 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 da, -da and I wanna get this out of it, what'd you do? And then all of a sudden, they're frozen because they have boundaries, yeah. right? And, and so, to me, see, the thing is, you can't understand that un unless you're there, you know, and you're in some way involved in the process. Or, hey, what about like, uh, yeah, you got 30 kids, and then like somebody mouths off, somebody's cracking, what do you do? Like, how do you deal with that? See, that's coaching, that's leadership, that's communication, right? And, and the thing is, but you can go, well, listen, uh, you should just uh, fucking get more leads. Nah, dude, nah, that doesn't work that way, right? In real life, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people that do a lot of ways, but for me, man, like, you have to always keep in touch with reality. But I do think that, I, I do think that's true for anything, you know, even the members, and I've kind of been there, you know, where, where like I'll get messages like, man, it's so good to have you back, like involved so much so often. And I feel great about that. And the thing is, I never go, when is this session done? Yeah. You know, like I, I can't wait to get off. Dude, I'm so in it yeah. that when it's done, it's like, I just came from a blackout. Yeah. Oh man, okay, cool. Now I gotta go do whatever, you know, write a blog. Or and you anything. focus on stuff, you run business in a way that is going to lead to you know, uh, customer loyalty, you focus more on that than, than new customer acquisition and keeping people around, which a lot of people don't do. They're just like, how can I get more leads? How can I gotta do Facebook ads? You're like, man, people want connection, they want community, and that's what you guys are built. That's what you do such a great job of. So people are gonna become a brand advocate and just stay for life. And and so, you know, and I've made that mistake, right? Of yeah. like, man, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's grow. Um, but to build a perennial business. So I mean, this is just like some crazy math stuff. Although I, I hate sometimes, I hate, even like, even on content stuff like this, I hate saying like, you know, leads and cu customer lifetime value. And I get it, like it's a financial thing that you gotta understand and what part of your brain. But even when I say it, I kind of feel a little guilty because I'm like, no, that's like, I, I wanna put a name to that person. Yeah. That's a real person to yeah. me, you know what I mean? Like, so I think, you know, that it starts, like everybody starts fucking doing metrics. But I'm like, listen, okay, if I get a person in and I help them change their life and I help them continue to build like, uh, them as a person, get them to their dream, and instead of them staying four months, they stay four years, yeah. right? Let's look at the numbers of that, right? Like you're right. making 10 times more revenue. And I would rather have, think about this, when we look at the next 10 years, there's gonna be some type of recession, a meteor will fall and rent, and some shit will happen, who knows, right? And when it does, like if I continue to have 220 members, for instance, and they're all consistent and we're a tribe and like we do like fucking in uh, The Walking Dead, we build our own little city to protect ourselves, whatever. You know what? That's a perennial business. It's gonna continue to stay, it's gonna live, it's gonna thrive, even if internet goes down, you know, that nobody can find you on social media. That's my foundation. My foundation is if, if internet went down, phone went down, TV, everything collapses, does, does Vigor Ground both survive and thrive? Just by word of mouth, by pigeons and shit, like whatever, yeah. man, like, you know what I mean? But that, that's the foundation. Then, when you add everything else on top of it, you know, I got my funnels, I got my Facebook ads, I got my social media, I got this, I got email marketing, and I understand all those things, that's just fuel to the fire. Yeah. But you gotta go back to the foundation and the customer experience, because then, I would rather, honestly, I would rather have the same amount of members not gain one for the next 10 years, mm -hmm. right? And completely change and help change those people's lives, then have 400, 150, 220. Yeah. And it's just like, and people come and go, and you don't have any true like legacy. You don't have any foundation. And then, and the thing is, and you it's feel good about it. for you. Oh, absolutely, yeah, exactly. completely, man. Yeah. Like you're you're constantly stressed out. Oh, how are you doing? Break, break, break month. Oh, fuck, yeah. we're losing a lot of people. What's it like? It's you know, it, it it's it's habit. Yeah. And so. 
that's my focus is like why don't we make it so amazing be like now is, that, is was that most of your business here was word of mouth like this is before you could afford to do much yeah, advertising it, it was like uh Mainly it was word of mouth it was word of mouth actually but one thing i did is and, and this i think is important too right um people talk shit about big box gyms um and I, I don't, you know, even though I didn't I kind of agree with the value, I mean, they didn't have leave these values or whatever else. But guess what, man? Like, there was thousands of people there. I just, all I focused on was, like, doing a great job with people. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd get, like, reprimanded because I do different sales because I was like, nah, dude, like, that's not true. I want to bring this person value. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times people couldn't afford stuff. And I'd be like, hey, give me your email, man. I'll just, like, send you a, a couple of Word documents with meal plans and different stuff. And they're like, really? And I'd send them stuff. And then like they would like come in like thanks so much for that dude I did the workout it was great and I did that for like at, 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 you know LA Fitness for like a year yeah and so those people became part of the people that were like oh I love your stuff so I had them on a Google group uh, sorry Google Yahoo group email list okay so I didn't have an email list I didn't have a web or sure, any of that yeah. but like basically every week or sometimes every couple weeks or sometimes a couple weeks they're like hey here's this cool article like read this or I like, write them something right so it was email marketing but really I didn't think of it that way because yeah. I didn't understand that. I was just like keeping in touch, right? Like, yeah. And people were like, oh, thanks so much. So when I opened this spot, I literally emailed out, I said, hey, listen guys, two week free trial, you know, I'm opening up boot camps. And all these people that were like, oh dude, this guy really helped me out. I mean, really like the pure foundational kind of uh, idea of word of mouth, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the first, when we opened, we had a two week free trial, uh, 21 people did it, and 14 people signed up right after, after the 14 days. Yeah. So, 14 people or whatever you know 197 and, and you, can, you can do the numbers like we were you know I was profitable because I was working full-time 12 14 hour days now how long were you here at this spot uh, almost three about three and about three when days. you closed this spot down how many clients did you have uh, it was probably around a hundred I'd say. okay uh, something like was it just you at the end still no I know I had a coach so what ended up happening is like I just had morning classes because I was working you know 6 p.m. or peak times at the big box gym uh, so I actually got a coach from that gym that wasn't working those hours uh, that was like, hey, do you want to make some extra money and run 6 p.m.? Because people were constantly like, hey, are you going to do anything in the evening? Are you do anything in the evening? Yeah. So we ended up opening a 6 p.m. class mm -hmm. and I had a coach run that before, which was good because, you know, it kind of taught me about like, hey, I can I can make money and not be there. Yeah. Right. Um, so let me ask you, if so someone's in this position now, let's say they have 600 to 1,000 square feet, they're doing everything that you were doing yeah. 10 years ago. What's the first hire? Another coach? Or admin. an assistant, an, an admin, assistant, an admin. Absolutely. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, just because, just because here's the thing, right? Like, if you coach, mm -hmm. right, you're probably the best in your business yeah. at that thing. Hopefully, you should. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise, you need to get better. But yeah. so, what are you probably not the best at? Answering phone calls, yeah. writing emails, uh, you know, things like that. Like, you have done it for a while, and you can now teach the per other person. Go like, look, you know, here's how I do things, and I just want to make sure you do it this way. But then there's gonna be a person that's really proficient, probably 10 times more than you, right? Somebody has done admin work before, I mean, they're like knocking stuff out like pff, nothing, right? They're answering the phones, they're really nice, all this good stuff. And now you have more time to coach a couple more people. Maybe your hour now is worth 100 bucks or 70 or 200, who knows if you're running groups, right? So if you're paying admin, really good admin, like, I don't know, you know, starting 18, 20 bucks, whatever, you're not mm -hmm. paying them cheap, cheap money, but, you know, now, like, you're paying them 18, but you can make 100, you know, or, or 80 or 200, like, it's just... Now, where do you draw the line on that? Because, you know, the saying is true, you get what you pay for, right? So, like, like, so many times in business, people make the mistake, and I've made it, you try to save money and pay someone less than what you want to, and then they suck and you end up doing everything yourself. I, it's, I would, it's, a, it's a tough... It, it's a toughie because there, there's always exceptions. Um, like, for instance, like, Tosh, who... Uh, you, you've met obviously mm -hmm. our front desk person you know she was a member mm -hmm. she went from a member to doing a little bit of work and I just uh, basically we kind of exchange services the thing about exchanging services you got to get rid of that as soon as possible yeah if somebody's really good you just got to pay them. yeah right because because sooner or later they won't they, they don't have any type of purpose behind it if you if you don't invest in them and show them that you're that they're worth it um, a lot of times to be honest like I'd rather have somebody do 15 hours a week or 20 and pay them more then do 30, 35 and pay them less than their shit. Yeah, so totally. that that's certainly like, hey, there's so much stuff that you can do now. Like for instance, we still have, you know, we don't have an admin a big part of the week because that's a lot of money going out on payroll, you know, in those dead hours, there's not a lot of people coming through, but we have a company that does, you know, somebody calls, it goes to them. They're like, hey, you know, everybody's on the floor right now. Uh, you know, we're, we don't, we don't bullshit. They're like, hey, we're a company that takes 
um, you know, calls for them, like, you know, we'll, we'll get right back to you. And they send us an email and I get even a text who called their phone number, what they wanted and stuff like that. Now that costs probably six, five to six times less than having a full-time admin there. So there's a lot of ways around that. Right? Yeah. There's a way, because like I said, we're not a big box gym where I'm like, hey, I got a you know, 16 hour a day admin at the front desk, because that, you know, that can crush you, especially at the get-go. But if somebody can bundle like all the leads that are get coming in, like all the billing, all the CC rejects, and they can knock that out in 12 to 15 hours because they're great and treat people awesome and write them thank you cards and all these good things, I mean, pay them like way more you know but they'll they'll stay and they'll be great and then you kind of build it up as your business grow versus like because this is the mindset right and this is a scarcity mindset i think that a lot of gym owners have is fuck like i'm gonna do everything because i gotta save money right mm -hmm. and that comes into play at a certain point in time but the thing is if you're doing that and it's and it's hurting the service, mm. right, of the person. So now you're trying to do everything to save money, but now you're late for the coaching clients. You don't get the, you're their program. You're always burned out, you're in a bad mood. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Now the actual goal of what you do as your vocation is suffering. Yeah. That's a fucking problem, right? Yeah. I would rather go like, well, you know what? Instead of making, you know, going, I'm making 2,500 bucks a month, but I'm gonna not make more for the next six months because I'm gonna invest in an admin, I'm gonna invest in XYZ, yeah. because we just talked about this, the big picture, right? right? People look Long at their, the, the long game, you know, versus the short game. And I, and I think that's part of the reason we've done well is because, you know, I'm always looking at the long game. Alexander Codd, who did the, the samurai painting and did all the paintings in the back, you know, just came in and, and, I, and, I, and I paid him a, a chunk of for the last work. And, to, you know, to be honest, I, I think a lot of gym owners would go like, oh, dude, you, you spent how much on that art? Right? Like, oh, you could buy fucking like seven more hip thrust machines. Yeah. I'm like, see, but to me, like that, that is part of the atmosphere and like what people feel when they come in. And I don't, you know, I don't know if, if like people see, you know, uh, three hip thrust machines instead of two is going to change their life. Right. Well, neither is the samurai. But, but the thing is, but it does, it relays like who we are. Yeah. You know, like every right, so, part so, of so, so let's talk about that one when we get down there. Let's just wrap it up here. So, so at what point do you decide, okay, I've outgrown this space. I'm ready to take a huge risk and move into the bigger so space. So my, man, my personal opinion on this actually is probably maybe different than some others. Okay. Um, to me, like it was, I always said, okay, if I go from here to wherever else, yeah. can I already break even? But, but the thing is, is like, because the coaching and the culture and the customer service was great, right? And it didn't matter if it wasn't the, you know, hey, here's your towel, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and so that's what I try to tell people, like, man, you can have a, you know, shady garage gym, but you can have everything else be so excellent that you can grow and keep growing and charge a premium rate, you know, when it's the right time, and then you can move, mm -hmm. right? And I think too many people are, uh, are, are trying to live other people's dreams. Oh, uh, you know, Joe D has that, Luca has this, uh, that guy's got this, so I saw this person's $2 million gym, and you know, oh man, Todd Durkin, or you know, like, and it's like, dude, that's, don't, you know, uh, uh, Charlemagne de God has a great book, and, and he said he's got a chapter that says, fuck your dreams, right? And, uh, and it, it's not what it sounds like, but fuck your dreams is like, hey, fuck your dreams when your dreams are somebody else's dreams. Okay. Right? You're trying to be somebody else, yeah. man. Like, dude, what's your dream? Right. You know, you're trying to be a rapper, yeah, maybe, a lot you know. Of people do that. A lot, yeah. you know, like, but dude, you don't even like fuck rap. Like, you're an engineer, but you'll be the best engineer in the world. Yeah. But you're trying to follow somebody else's dreams. And in the gym industry, this is super prevalent. Like, maybe you have, I mean, I went my own rap, but maybe, dude, you have the best 1,500 square foot gym in the world. You got 100 members that each pay 400 bucks a month on average, and you're doing 600 grand a year, but you're profiting 400 grand, dude. Like, I don't know. There's so many different ways to mm -hmm. do it. Stop fucking chasing somebody else's dream. You know, like tap into what the voice is telling you, man. Like, and there's you can do whatever, right? But people chase this thing, and I see people burned out trying to chase this number or like how much revenue you're making. And you know, we we talked about like big names that like you know they bring in this much, but you know, 92% of that is also expensive. Yeah. You know, like uh, or you know that was the reason. And we'll, we'll talk about it when we get there. Is like why did I buy a building? I mean, there's multiple reasons, right? But I mean, one certainly is equity you know uh, exit strategy if i wanted to i don't I, I, i'm never gonna want to leave you know but I, I know that but hey you know 10 years from now this place is worth you know two to three times what what i pay for it you know and, and it's already growing in that direction so that's just a like big big like idea and kind of um once again long game right because what i'm paying in a mortgage is a lot right yeah. but you could go like well shit, i could be putting down in my pocket like yeah but that's like small thinking and it's like right now thinking instead of big picture thinking. I mean, 
let's let's, let's walk and talk and, and um, go back to Slovenia. <laughs> All right, so now here we are at the new spot, which is what about a year old now? Uh, yeah, literally July I think is grand opening. Yeah, uh, and just down the block, and this is what five times the size of the original one we're at. Ten. Ten. Actually, eleven if you count if you count the whole building. Okay. It's actually so the whole building, the bottom floor is ten thousand, and then we got a little less than two thousand at the uh, in that mezzanine. So it's like close to twelve thousand square feet for, wow. the whole, for the whole building. Yeah, yeah. And one of my favorite places. I mean, you have created a masterpiece here. I just love Thank this gym. Thank you, man. I, I mean, not only the equipment, the layout, the building, the stairs, everything about it. So it's also the culture that you've created here, which is a testament to you and who you are. And and I always tell people like, you walk into Vigor and you're gonna see every race, every age, every shape, size, color, it's amazing. And it feels like such a family atmosphere that you just wanna be part of and hang out all day long. And I think, you know, I think one of the things that, as we came from the old spot, right, like, I, the key for any business that grows, I think, is like, how do you keep the values and the virtues and the culture the same, right? Like, it's a bigger building, but you can't lose, like, look, we improve right. stuff, but you can't lose, like, what happened in the garage. You can't lose the way you treated people. You can't lose. Now you can upgrade things. I mean, as you grow, you learn new things. You, you know, you, you find out stuff about yourself and it's like, oh shit, that was a maybe negative trade or whatever, right? Like, and you change and, that, and it evolves. But at the core, it's like, you know, you want to be able to go, there's, you know, there's still people here and I, I love this, right? They've been around for like legitimately like eight, nine, 10 years. Uh, we call them the OGs, you know, they come, they, they, they were at the garage. There's actually a lot of people from there, which That's is, which is super cool. oh man, it's the dopest thing ever, you know, and, and, it's, and it's like, they'll still tell these like culture stories. Oh man, I remember where like, we pushed the prowlers outside and like bus would come and like nobody would move. We just finished the sets, you know, like, and that became the norm and you know, and the police always come in for me. But the thing is like that, like how do you transfer that? Cause I think people lose that. Like, they think they become too good for certain things. They're like, well, well, now we're here, you know, like now we gotta, and it's like, nah, man, actually you gotta keep a lot of who you are and then just upgrade it. Upgrade it and, you know, obviously, just like Bruce Lee says, right? You learn new things and you eliminate the stuff that doesn't help you, you know, that doesn't serve you or doesn't serve your people. And you add in new things, you know, that do serve your people. And over time, there's this evolution. Um, but at, at, at the foundational level, you know, when we moved in here, I told the team, I said, guys, I hope you understand, like, I'm back in the garage right now, me personally, here and here, because it makes me feel like we're starting over. And you gotta feel like that, because when you start being like, oh, look at this spot, like, man, build it and they'll come. And, you know, now that we're here and, you know, people talk about us, like, people just throw money at us. It's like, no, man, like, you, that's the beginning of the end. Like, you, that, that is legitimately, like, that's how things end. Oh, our marketing's on point or this, like, we're the guy, like, no, man, like, you gotta stay true, you know, straight, stay true to yourself and everything from the, like, the tree, man, the tree has roots and then it grows up, but the roots stay, you take the roots out, like tree dies, right, it falls over. And I think a lot of people get rid of their roots, you know, and it's like you can't get rid of the roots. You can, you can add skill sets, add things on top of it, you know, remove some stuff that maybe is not that great, but at the foundational level, like, who do you become? You know, it's like, th this has to still be like that in, in many ways for it to be able to be perennial and to live and stand a test of time. All right, so this is, uh, you know, the, the lobby and, and what we wanted to end up doing was obviously having a place that people can, you know, at the, at the other two gyms, we, we didn't really have this place where people can chill and stay afterwards, which I think is so important, right? Because it's like oh, you yeah. talk about the third place and the third place is like, you know, we're done. Oh man, we foam roll upstairs, we sit here, we, we have a smoothie and stuff like that. And uh, we were able to, you know, my idea was always like, how do we integrate everything together? And you know, it kind of came that like I, I knew these guys. They had great smoothies, uh, acai bowls. Like they, their mindset around nutrition and health was very intact. And I remember bringing them in when this was like a shit show, and it wasn't anything like it is right now. It was literally the old building. And I was like, "Here's what I'm gonna do," you know. And they're like, "All right, man, we believe you." And so they were they were in, you know. So we we brought them in. Um, the the design was I had architects do it, but like my, the. The, the feel and the flow and everything was like completely mine. Like we sat down, I was like, man, this is what I wanted to feel like. I want it to be higher end, but I want it to be rugged. I want it to have a feel of, you know, um, it's almost like, you know, remember where we came from and then the, look at the future. Like if you, you know, so even the building in itself, it's 93 years old, you know, the trusses are literally like, you'll see architects say, you cannot, like nobody builds with this anymore. These are massive, you know, uh, massive trusses from like one piece yeah. of wood. And we wanted to keep that, expose that, and show this history. Oh, it's amazing how um, much character that adds to the place. And, 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 and you know, but at, at the same time, um, you know, have that, like, 
like you got the stone, right? Polished floors, you got the metals, and you got the yeah. wood, and then the glass, obviously, you know, we ripped out all the storefronts. This just like perfect example. Right now, summer, open up all the doors, cross breeze comes through, feels like almost open area. Um, and you know, that was kind of like the whole idea. It's like if you're in a kitchen and you have an open kitchen, why? Because you're entertaining, you're making the food, you're talking, you're having a drink, you know, football games on, whatever. Like I want it to be like the same kind of feel where like people are training, people here are chilling, having a smoothie, high-fiving, going out, the music's everywhere, you know. Um, and, 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 and it came, I mean, I'm honestly, like nothing's perfect, but it came, you know, together just as good as, as we could and also have like this area that's a little more semi-private training based and you got the turf where you can do the teep training. We got, you know, a big rig that can be used for multiple purposes. We got a deadlift platform area, energy system area. Um, Take a little tour through the aisle and tell me about the staircase here. All right, so the staircase has a story. Um, and really what it was is like the, we, we, we wanted the, the staircase to be the centerpiece, like almost like, a, you know, artwork inside of the gym. And same thing, I said, look, I like industrial. I want it to be industrial. I want it to loop up. Uh, but this, you know, this is like South African acacia. Uh, you know, the, the beams are like, everything is cut to spec, like it's completely custom made. But what ended up happening is that the, the company actually um, underestimated how much it would cost to build it. Uh, so this in fact is, not all on our dime, a, uh, a $94,000 staircase. Um, you know, and, and let's just say that in our budget, what we paid for it out of budget was maybe a third of that. Um, so I always say, you know what I mean? Like, does Jay-Z have a $94,000 staircase? I don't know, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? But, yeah. um, but, but this is, uh, actually, let's, let's, let's go upstairs and kind of start upstairs because that's where our clients would start if they were coming in for a session. So this is the upstairs area. You can see Stav's like uh, doing some mobility stuff, but um, we, we kind of have it like split in between the offices. Uh, we want to have an area where people can come up, do foam rolling, soft tissue work. You know, we got the table do mobilizations, uh, you can pretty much see just about every tool there is to, to beat up the soft tissue. Um, actually, a lot of them are in, in the box. We got a chill spot, so after, you know, after certain things, coach might sit down. People are just, I mean, put it this way, it's like an area to hang out, right? Like, people are cooling down, they're talking, they're warming up. The more places that you can create for people to talk and bond, that's yeah. what culture is, right? Yeah. Like, it's, you create a space, you don't try to push anything, you create a space, and you create the opportunity for people to, to bond and create that culture. So we try to do as many of those things as possible. It takes it away from, you know, it's a, it, like it'll be louder downstairs, it'll be quieter up here. People can still talk, can do their thing before and after. Um, we can also do many workshops here, do mobility stuff. Uh, it's actually built to like be able to do like 10 to 12 person class of body weight and things like that as well. And then we have the, pretty much the offices, you know, team room, uh, Andre's office, my office. And to me, like, this is honestly, like, still always one of the best views every night when I, you know, get done with uh, training and working. I go down these stairs and it, and it does kind of give me this uh, just feeling of, reminds me of, like, where we came from, how far we've come. Um, and, and, it, and it is a feel of, you know, it's a pretty great feel of just, like, this open space that, where you can see everybody, you can see everybody working hard, you can see people connecting, doing the right things. and. Um, to me, I mean, to me, it's inspiring, right? It, it, it's, I think that your own work should inspire you, and not in a, I would say, arrogant way, but in a way of like how, you know, we we, we came from here to here. What's this next frontier, you know, that we're gonna we're gonna go to? So, um, you know, we we can go downstairs and kind of go around how the layout of the gym is and why it was this way, uh, based on the way the building is. All right, so the, so the gym is kind of split up. I mean, obviously you have the space that you have. Um, these two rooms that you kind of can't see, we're putting a cryo chamber in there. It's gonna be called a recovery room. And then all the great stuff, you know, that you don't see in most places, but yep. the glue ham rays, the, uh, the back extension. Uh, we actually kind of split it to where both, both sides that have. We got glue ham, reverse hyper, back extension. Uh, right now the squat rack has uh, a cell out of the sandbags in there, but it's elite FTS rack, so we can have all the attachments on there. Uh, so one, I wanted to have at least you know four racks plus we got uh, six stations on the rig, um, but then from there we go into and this is like all of a semi-private area. Uh, we took three of the platforms for old, old spot. Uh, as you can see, one you know art is big here, right? Like quotes are big here. The uh, the Seattle skyline. I mean you know 
is, is, is certainly one of those like, hey, this is 206, you know, C-Town. Uh, with just yeah, work. One of my favorite quotes of all time. I, like I, man, that's, that's uh, I mean, that, that is pretty much one of our, I would say, uh, values, right? One of our values we we'll always talk about, like as far as making, you know, like every person that comes in here, like programming is important. Sure, all of these things are important, but like, hey, how did, how did you make that person feel? That's what they're gonna remember. And that's at the core of sessions, of everything, right? Um, we have our energy systems, so you can see it's, it's a good amount of them. Um, from aerodyne bikes to to ski erg to uh, to to rowers to in the corner that that's actually the first like hip like hip uh, hip punch machine that the the Seahawks had that Joel Jameson gave to me. Oh, really? Yeah, dude, this is like the it's the original, it's the prototype, um, and we we still use it. You know, what I mean, it's it's actually pretty good for for doing some uh, some cool stuff. The artwork, I always I want to always give a shout out to my guy Alexander Cod. So, you know, if you guys saw in the beginning, uh, we had uh, you saw the samurai. It's like completely commissioned work on that wood, um, but that is, you know, a lot, 190 hours worth of work of, of spray. It's actually, it's stenciled, right? So it's stenciled, 17 different stencils to uh, black, gray, white to create that. And what I wanted to do is like just, and you see a lot of places that have, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like bodybuilding heroes or, uh, you know, superheroes, which, which we have too. But to me, I was like, man, who are people that change the world? I think sometimes, um, you know, you kind of got to, uh, I don't even say shoe higher, but like to me, those are the people that like, I read their works, you know I mean? Uh, from Bruce Lee to, to Gandhi, to Muhammad Ali, to yeah. uh, Martin Luther King, to Nelson Mandela, to Einstein. I mean, I quote these guys a lot. Like I've read their works, you know, they've changed the world essentially, you know, through, through their own struggles and um, through, uh, through their own struggles. and. You know, like, why don't we do something different? Why do we make it a little abstract so people have to actually look, you know, and, and pay attention? And, and to this day, man, I, I'll trail on this turf. I do my conditioning, you know, multiple times a week. Like, I can't not go hard or finish strong or, you know, right. looking yeah. at that, man. It's I just, it. it's, and, and that's real, you know, like, I'll have these days and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm done. And it's like, we have this, uh, uh, like, with the whole team, I have this thing, and it's, I call it the land of legends. So whenever I start yelling that, it usually means shit's about to go down and like we're about to crush workouts. And, but you know, but that's the thing, you know, I say, look, man, I, these people are looking at me like, this is why I aspire to be, you know, in a, in a sense of like helping people, right? Because you might look at somebody there and be like, they're not millionaires or billionaires or whatever, but man, like each person there, like change the world in some way, you know, and, and change millions of people and help millions of people out. So that's an inspiration to me. It's not just like, hey, I want to be like that personal trainer. You know what I mean? It's, it's more than that. And, same thing with the the Ali graphic, you know, back there is which, which from Alex, and you know one of one of the things about that is it really is kind of you know impossible is nothing. Just a reminder that like that you know the human will and the human like the the human can achieve um, impossible things like that we create glass ceilings for ourselves, right? Like you'd never believe that in in reality if you understand comic books and Marvel and stuff like that that like you know that. That Ali can knock out Superman, but it's but it's like I mean I, if you read the comic, there was a time when that happened, but nonetheless it's like hey, this is you know this is this is not impossible. Like strive to do things that nobody has achieved. Was it really? Before. Did that really happen? In there's, a Marvel, a, there, in a, there's a special edition where they had like it, it was a, a essentially it was like a a, chari it's a charity event. You know what uh -huh. I mean? And and they fought. Of course, Superman didn't want to use his powers. Yeah. yeah. So Ali knocked him down, okay, knocked okay. him out. But it but yeah. it. But it's not, you know, obviously, it's not like some super strength stuff. Yeah. But, but this image, like this image to me represents, like, yeah. hey, if this is the most powerful, you know, like being, whatever, you know, on, yeah. on a planet, and it's like, but a, a human that has the mindset and the work ethic, you know, can beat him. And, and to me, like, even if you don't, you know, ever do that, you strive for that, you're gonna achieve more than you ever yeah. can. And that's that whole, you know, like, hey, you can't choose your potential, but you can choose to fulfill your potential, you know? And so I think that's so important that like, um, you know, you're a big fan of the culture code. I'm, I'm a big fan of the culture code, uh, Daniel Coyle's work. And it's like, like have things around you that remind you of your, your mission, your vision, your, your, you know, that wall's getting slogans on it. You know, there's, they're all over the place, you know, from do the work to, to give anything less than your best and sacrifice the grift until we all win, you know, like rise as one, us and we, like a, that's a big, big, big theme for us, you know what I mean? for the good of all. Like if I, if we all don't win, I don't win. You know what I mean? Like everybody's gotta win. Like if we're doing something together, you gotta win, I gotta win. You know, otherwise I'm not gonna even do it. I'm not even gonna go into it. And so what are the things that 
you create in, in this environment that remind you of who you are, that remind you of what you're striving for, that remind you about, you know, like when a person comes in and so many times they go like, you know, man, like I come in here, I'm tired and then I look at this and it's like just the stuff that's here, just little triggers that make me go, all right, it's time to work, man. It's time to get better. It's time to, you know, upgrade myself, right? And so those, those things matter, man. I, and I, I believe like if you put much more effort and work into the customer experience, the little things that seemingly may not mean much because you might say, oh, well, I'll spend some more money on an ad than I will, you know, spending thousands on, you know, artwork, actually tens of thousands on artwork in this building. But the reality is like these are all differentiators that, that, that talk about what, you know, what you believe in, what you represent, you know, who you are. And in a world where everything can be copied, a funnel can be copied, sales processes can be copied, um, I mean, you name it, systems can be copied. You know, what can't be copied is one, you know, who you are in position, like how you communicate. And then, like the coaching and the customer experience, you can't copy that. Yeah. Like, or it's, it, it's incredibly difficult to do. Like you can't just go copy paste or, you know, it's a lot, lot more work. And so, to me, all this other stuff is, you know, the tip of the iceberg everybody can see. And what makes things great is below the water where nobody can see and you gotta actually come and, and experience it and be entrenched in it. To, to create, you know, to create something great. And the reality is, man, like, what, you know, what's difficult is scarce, and what's scarce is valuable. So, like, the easier it is, the more people can do it. The harder it gets, the, the less people are gonna do it. Right. So hard Way harder to copy. Way yeah. harder to copy. Yeah. So it's like, you know, this is not the most, the easiest model to run, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, absolutely not. Every day I'm like, oh, well, somebody's like, dude, you could be way more profitable, like, this way. And just run it like this. I'm like, yeah, but then it's not the greatest. And then why the fuck would I do that? You know, that's just, crazy to me, right? Uh, why would I, then I, you know, let, let me get a, a couple of franchises of whatever restaurant or, or whatever, right? Like a franchise and there's nothing wrong with that. And we'll just churn it like, you know, a system and do that, that, but like, but this to me is a work of art. Like everything is, it's like you're sculpting, you know, you're sculpting this, this, this masterpiece. And like, that's why I don't want to have multiple gyms, you know, because it's, it's like, as soon as you do that, your efforts go multiple directions. Yeah, you're managing more people, you're, you know, and for people that do that, hey, hey, Man, I, 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 you know, I, I, that's inspiring. I think it's great. Everybody's got their own thing, right? But, but for me, like, I'd rather create one, one thing, and it's the best in the world, and then teach how we did that, you know, in business coaching or in training systems or in coaching or in customer experience or all the because this becomes a lab and it becomes very, very, I would say, um, like more in depth, right? Like I can go more in depth with everything because I'm here, because I'm coaching people, because I'm with my coaches all the time because I'm like shaking hands and kissing babies all day long, you know? And it's like, and you can feel it. Like you, you can talk, I sit down with people and talk about why they're here and their struggles and you know, their pains and desires and frustrations. And it's so it's so real that like, I see every aspect of it. The marketing, the sales, the training, the people, the communication, the connection, the management, the leadership. And it's like, and it's very, very narrow. Like it's like this incubator of, of growth. As soon as you go, okay, now we're gonna open up one here, 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 here. To me, it takes away from, like, you know, if, 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 uh, if there were, I don't know, like how many Mona Lisas, you wouldn't appreciate the one, you know? And, and it is, it's like, work is art, right? Your writing is art, your, you know, the podcasting is art, like everything is art. And then, you know, do you just kind of hobby it or do you wanna become the best in the world at it? If you wanna become the best in the world at it, then the little fucking minutia thing matters and you do it exceptionally well, but then you know what? that has a, a profound and I'll say ex, ex, exponential kind of result, right? Like, hey, if you, like high-fiving somebody is not a big deal, right? For most people. But what if you high-five everybody the best with a smile, with this energy, or if you, you know, talk to somebody for two, three minutes, but like you're so engaged, like, I'll be like, oh, okay, I get that. That's not a hard thing to do. Okay, cool, if it's not a hard thing to do, do it with every single person, every fucking day, yeah. do it phenomenally well, like and inspire them in two to three minutes, and then do that for 10 years. And then it will change your world, it will change their world, and you'll become the best in the world and you make a lot of money, right? But of course, that's hard, right? And so, you know, but that's the approach that I look at taking with everything I do. I mean, even with the marketing stuff, even with the, you know, the sales and the, like the, just the little stuff. I'm like, man, how can we do this better? Hey, when somebody does this, let's do that. Like, what about, the, you know? It, and, I, and the thing is, I find myself really um, at peace working really hard, focusing on, mm. on the minutia. You know what I mean? Like when you focus on the process and the journey, like all this other stuff disappears, you know, like stressed out about competition and da 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 da, whatever, man. Like you're just there. And 
you're just like, how do I make this the greatest? And it will never be everything I want it to be, but I think that's part, part of the process, right? It's like, you're never gonna arrive at that place. You're just gonna keep getting there. And once you fall in love with that, you know, a lot of, I would say the anxiety falls, falls away too. Yeah. You know what I mean? And my friend, I didn't come all this way from LA just to talk. I think it's time to train. Now let's do it. Let's do it. All right, let's talk training. Let's do Tell it. Tell me a little bit um, about your, your overall philosophy of training, some of your biggest influences, and you know, how you prioritize. Um, man, I, that, that's actually a, it is a tough question because yeah. I, I would certainly say it depends, and obviously nobody likes to hear that shit, but uh, let's, be, let's start with like my biggest influences, um, where certainly I would say, you know, Pavel was just like, if you said, ask me who was the first person that really influenced you, you know, pretty drastically in fitness, certainly Pavel. Okay. Um, and when I started exploring, and before that I'd done a ton of study. I mean, like, like I said, I've read, you know, Zasiorski's and Bampas, but it was, it's very hard to uh, have that person inspire you into a certain philosophy and principle. Yeah, so what was it about Pavel's stuff that you think had such Man, an impact on you? I mean, number one, it was the moment in time where, you know, I did my first cuttable training session where uh, my brother took me to the guy, Grega, who, who was the guy that um, uh, showed us kettlebells for the first time, you know, and it was like, my brother was like, hey, look, man, I just did this workout with this metal ball, and it's like, it'll crush you. I'm like, man, it won't, what a, fire, whatever, man. Right, we did this 30, 30, 40 minute workout. I mean, I was smoked, you know, swings, clean and presses, goblet squats, you know, and here I am, I was, you know, deadlifting and squatting pretty heavy fucking now, weight. Now, because someone who knows you, and me especially, knowing you well, there's a little bit of a dichotomy there because Pavel's thing is sub-maximal training. <laughs> that is not what I associate <laughs> no, no, with you. No, no, Sub-maximal no. nothing is listen, what I associate listen, with you. Listen, <laughs> we, we started a conversation who was my influence. Um, you know, not what I do right now. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, but you know, the, the reality is, I, I still think I, I am, uh, I use a lot of, put it this way, you know, I was so heavily influenced by kettlebells in uh, the beginning of my career yeah. that, I mean, we called the first gym the kettlebell, kettlebells the body project. I mean, that was the, wow. the, before it was vigor ground, you know, yeah. and, um, and yes, it was because I, I studied, you know, enter the kettlebell was my kind of first resource. And from there, from there was power to the people. Yeah. And you know, what influenced me was that when I did that, I had insane results. Yeah. And I kind of flipped the switch from, you know, what, even what you say you see me do now, um, you know, where I was like, all right, I'm gonna believe in this and let's go with it. You know, let's, let's do sets of five, two sets of five every day. You know, and I was like losing my mind doing it, but I was like, I'm gonna stick to this. You know, and my strength just went up. I mean, I hit my PRs in bench, hit my PRs in squat, you know. Um, so that obviously opened the door to that. And, and I was even, you know, personally, obviously mentored by, by Pavel through, uh, you know, doing a, one of the first, if not the first, I think, RKC in, in Europe. Um, you know, uh, also other events that I go to, he'd be there. We'd spend a good amount of time together. Um, and everybody back then, it was like Steve Cotter and, and, uh, and uh, Steve Maxwell and Kenneth J. And just a lot of the, you know, I'd say the legends of, of kettlebells, you know. Yeah. So I just had this really good foundation and I, and I studied everything. Um, so that was certainly one. And, and I think it's important to point out for people who don't know, I mean, you like to train super hard. That's part of your DNA. That's part Absolutely. of everything you're about. Yes. But you don't crush people just to crush people. Like you still no. consider the biological cost of training, of Absolutely. a training session, of a periodized program. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's important to understand that, like, you know, people zone in on the, like, for instance, if I write up like, hey, this is, you know, even yesterday's leg session. I mean, would I put most people through that? Like, absolutely not. Like, it'll destroy you, you know? But then I also have, you know, so many years of training. I respond certain ways to certain things. And part of it is, what do I enjoy, you know, or, right. or what pushes me past the point to grow? You know, like, there's a lot of factors here. It's not just, you know, there's, put it this way, like if I give you the number eight, you can get, you know, four plus four is eight, but so is six plus two, so is two times four. So, right, and to me that eight is what you want. Like in fitness, there's so many ways to get there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't give a shit what anybody, like, no, 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 you can only lift heavy, really heavy weights and get to this point. Maybe if you want to be an elite power lifter, but what if you want to get, pretty damn strong and be explosive and do that. Do you need Olympic lifts? No, do you need to, right? Like there's so many different ways we can do it. And writing a program or creating some structure for somebody doesn't entail just like, you have to understand, yeah, sure, what, what is the science behind it? But then what if you hate doing, like I, I remember a period of six months, 
I could not fucking do a Bulgarian split squat. For some reason, I was just disgusted by them. I don't know if I did so many of them. And it's like, if, if you wrote me a program and put in a Bulgarian split squat, I'm gonna slap you, right? I'm like, dude, I don't wanna do that. And imagine you going like, well, but no, this is gonna get you a great result. Like, but dude, I don't wanna do that, right? Okay, cool, well, do you wanna do a step up? Yeah, cool, do a step, you know what I mean? Like, so there's so many different things and my mindset around that has changed so much because number one, if I could get somebody coming here for a year, you can make them the best program in the world for like, and they'll follow it for eight weeks. I'll give them like a meh program for 12 months uh, and I'll coach the shit out of it. And this person will be, will crush the person, the other person with the best program. So, you know, I, I've, I've started looking at a lot of like fitness also behind what's fun, what's challenging, what's, uh, what does, you know, what does change psychology say? You know, what do social sciences say? You know, and I think that matters because I remember even back in the day when we started running group training sessions and boot camps, you know, and I was the guy, oh, we're, we're building a four week block, you know, and then there's a week off and it's like, man, that's so, I, that's so crazy. When you actually zoom away from it and you go like what people want, what drives them, what makes them keep coming back, that is, there's still people doing this, right? I'm like, okay, but what if next Tuesday somebody just comes to join your team training? What, like, what are you doing with this fucking four week block? Like, yeah. Well, they can't join at that time. I'm like, come on, man, like this is crazy. They won't wanna join two weeks later. Motivation is fleeting in a lot of this stuff, right? So you gotta get them in and get them going and help them out. And, and so, you know, you gotta look at so much many more factors. And the reality now is like, look, if I wanna get a pump in my chest, I'm gonna throw in a bunch of shit that's gonna pump my chest up at the end of the workout, you know? And somebody can go like, yeah, but it'll be more effective. It's like, no, what's more effective is that I keep, keep doing this and I keep doing it consistently and I'm gonna get a result. Now, if you give me an Olympic sprinter or a guy that's about to have a UFC fight in 16 weeks, I'm gonna probably look at that different, right? And once again, guess what? I'm probably gonna have to plug in things that they like, dislike, hey, how much jujitsu are they doing? How much striking are they doing? I, I gotta find out everything else that happens in their life to kind of create this program. All right, now, so the average person, busy person, uh, just give me the, the hierarchy of training. What's important? What does the program need to include? Mobility, strength? Where do Absolutely. You prioritize uh, I mean, I, mean I still average dude looking at, looking to feel good, look good, perform well. Still, I'm I'm still gonna go with the, like it has to fit R7. You know, I mean that's Mike Robertson's. Obviously, he just made it uh, really simple to understand the, the seven different R's. Number one, release. Do some type of soft tissue work. Doesn't have to be crazy. I've definitely changed that over the years. Like as far as don't foam roll for ten minutes. You know, hit the like what are you gonna work on? Do you have some restrictions there? You know, knock them out. What do you like better? Lacrosse balls, foam roll, stick. I mean, there's a lot of different stuff. If you, know, if you go upstairs, there's a shit ton of stuff that we have. Just, just get something done for three, four, five minutes, you know, get some release. Reset, you know, I, I certainly am a big believer in resets. You know, and resets, uh, anybody has studied like, things like PRI or DNS, you know, it may be, like I said, the exhales, making sure that your hip is in the right position, you know, crawls from DNS stuff. But that does matter. You know, like some people will be like, ah, whatever. I'm like, look, from my personal experience and just the experience of coaching people, if some, most people are just massively sympathetic. I mean, shit, look at me, like, you know, I'm gonna bang while we're sitting here, uh, which by the way, you know, delicious. Look at this guy, he's gonna knock it out. First time, and he loves it. Um, but it's, you know, like how can I get him, get him a little less tone? You know, that's how you get people there in the gym. They've never trained, but they're tone, man. They're like flexing their lats because they're constantly stressed. Their breathing is shallow. You know, they're, they're in a sympathetic state all the time. I'm gonna try to get that a little bit more to na neutral, right? With breathing drills and then you got, you know, kind of, can I, can I get the joints as aligned as I possibly can? Great, and that's not gonna be something crazy. It's gonna be like maybe two drills, right? And if they're really out of whack, I'm gonna go, hey, do this, can you do this three, four drills at home? Look, it's really gonna help you. I'm gonna connect it to the anchor. So there's gotta be realist, there's a reset, and then there's readiness, which we know as just dynamic warmups, right? Now, that's usually gonna be like, what are we training? Let me get those joints ready um, to train. Now, I've, I've become a big fan of FRC, I don't eat functional range conditioning, um, and just through the philosophy, and, and of course, maybe it matters more to me today because I've had really bad injuries, I know you've had, where it's like, shit, dude, I don't wanna be beat up. And so, you know, really at the, 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 there has to be independence before there's independence, meaning, like, I have to be able to control my joint and sit, like, and by itself, if I then add stuff up to it, like, you know, can I, can I control my hip? Internal rotation, external rotation, full flexion, full extension, you know, before I load a, sh a, hip, a super heavy squat, if I can't do it by itself, as soon as I add weight, it's gonna create dysfunction at some point in time, right? So that dynamic warm up is gonna be in some way, hey, let's work this joint that, that we're gonna train today 
and get it functioning a little bit better, right? And then, and then of course, like, hey, if we're doing any lower body, hip mobility, hip extension, core activation, um, once again, doesn't have to be, you know, super long, but you know what? I, I have this philosophy around it, like mentally, some people need a little bit longer warm up, not because that's what's truly necessary, but because their mind is gonna be like, ah, now I'm ready. Yeah. And that's gonna make them confident because if they're not confident, they're gonna spaz out and they're gonna hold back and be tight and that's where they're gonna get injuries, right? From there, you got resistance, which is your strength training. Now, this is where I think there's a lot of variability, right? For most, like nowadays, average person, I'm gonna do some t form of, you know, a, let's say if it's, a, if it's an average person, I'm gonna do a strength superset with them. They're gonna train probably about three days a week, right? So, for instance, lower body, upper body, whether it's some type of deadlift hinge variation and then some type of push. Now, push may be horizontal, dumbbell bench press, could be even a way to, you know, push up, could just be a push up depending on their strength levels. And uh, RDL, trap bar deadlift, elevated sumo, right? I mean, we're gonna fit this to where they're at, body positioning, what they want. Yep. But that's gonna be heavier, right? Four, five, six reps, maybe eight. Like, once again, depends on their goals. From there, I'm gonna do some supplement work to support those two, right? And those are gonna usually be six to 12 rep range. And then I'm gonna finish off with some type of, I would say higher uh, end rep ranges. So I do wanna hit like, you know, most rep ranges in a training session for the average person because they're gonna get the most out of that. Um, I think everybody likes pump work. So like if I finish with that, they feel the pump. If they, there's certain things that they like, I'm gonna plug that in. Cause look, I don't give a shit what you say. You could convince somebody all day long on the science of what you're doing. Yeah. But if they're like, man, I really wanna, you know, feel tighter here and yeah. like feel, man, that's, I'm putting that in maybe a density set at the end. Then it's like, you know, they're doing bicep, tricep extensions and glute bridges, you know what I mean? For 12 minutes nonstop and they're feeling a butt pump and an arm pump, you know, but like we got the big rocks there at the beginning and they're winning. Um, and then once again, depending on where they are as far as, you know, after resistance is resilience, which is your conditioning. Um, I like to split those things up, uh, but if they can only come in so and so often, I'm gonna finish that off with different types of energy systems. So I, I think that even a, 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 a general client that wants to, you know, build strength and, and, and muscle, but then also kind of get leaner, I'm gonna have them do aerobic work, I'm gonna have them do some type of anaerobic work, but I'm also probably gonna have them do some type of uh, anaerobic elactic, you know, like six, eight second sprints with 52 second rest. I think that most people, you know, only train one energy system, and that's why they get smoked. I think a lot of people need aerobic work um, that helps you recover better, that helps you, you know, drop you in, para in parasympathetic mode. Um, but all of those, so I'm gonna hit all those, you know, R I think people throw it out because they think it's not that effective for fat loss. But Correct, and that's always the yeah. argument, but yeah. like, here's, okay, so I'll give you an example, right? This is something that I love doing myself. I'll come in, I'm tired, I'm gonna just look at the timer, turn it on and go like, I got 30 minutes. And then I just do like mobility drills and I'm just going, like nonstop. Just sometimes just what I fucking feel like. Sometimes I ride it up, but I, I, by the end of the 30 minutes I'm sweating. I never go past 150 beats per minute. I'm in that 120, 150 range. I'm in aerobic zone. Now I got aerobic work done for 30 minutes, but I also worked on improving my joint health, right? right. So it's like, man, that's a double whammy right there, right? Like, other stuff, you know, how can I improve some GP, you know, uh, like I just wrote a program for Lauren, so five minutes sled, five minutes bike, five minutes swings, five minute crawls, right? And she's just rotating, getting some different movement variability, never going past 150 beats per minute. She leaves, she's sweating, she's feeling great. The, the person that wants to train, because that is an issue, right? Like not, some people are very driven to train, I am. So instead of me not doing anything, I'm working out, I'm getting a sweat on, but I'm actually helping myself recover from the crazy shit I put myself yeah. through when I'm doing hard training day. So, you know, that, and the thing is, I like filters, I like boundaries. Uh, that's why I always liked R7, um, because it's like, also for my team, it was like, listen, guys, uh, I, I skipped reactive, so after readiness is reactive, which is our explosive uh, elasticity stuff, which some people, uh, you know, I got a guy right now that I'm just helping him really fix his hips. He doesn't have that yet but maybe in phase two he will, because I do think I'll, if you're 50, 60, 70 years old, you should still train to be explosive and powerful, maybe in different ways, but just the fact that one out of three people that fall break their hip is enough to me to like, hey, you know what? We're gonna do scoop tosses, hey, we're gonna do wall throws, we're gonna do foot fire, we're gonna do little mini hurdle hops, like, we're gonna do those things. Um, but now I have a filter, right? Now, if somebody goes, okay, cool, but like, you got a power lifter, so he just wants to get strong. 
cool. Well, now that, that piece of the pie that ends up being resistance, we're gonna do more basically, you know, uh, higher threshold motor unit stuff. So we're gonna do more stuff over 80% of max, over 90% of max. Now, but I'm gonna still fit in everything. I'm still gonna get their mobility. I'm still gonna get their resets. I'm still gonna get their aerobic work. It's just gonna be fit towards their main goal. They're probably not gonna be doing as much, you know, higher rep work, even though I do think that comes into play for them as well, because let's be real, if you're, if you're healthy, you can train longer without injury. When you can train long without injury, you're gonna get a better result. Um, and so I, I, think, I think Dr. John russell has got a, a lot of good things around that. And, and actually those two systems for me have fit together really well. We're like, you know, running things through R7, looking at what John does, but like through my experience, like, um, you know, I think there's so much variability in how you can build stuff that people get very, very locked in into one thing. For example, I'll give you an example program that like what we, what we do now with um, our small group. I'll literally break it down because like, our, I, I run a small group strength training Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday mornings. And the goal for those people is get stronger, build muscle. That's it, right? They're coming to our other team training sessions to do their conditioning. You know, that's our circuits, our density and whatnot. So in those programs, we're gonna do a dynamic warm up. We're gonna do our recess. And then it, I put a block up. Like block one is strength and power. Now I have a finite amount of time. I got an hour, hour 10 maybe that I gotta fit all this stuff in, right? So I'm a little bit restricted. So I'm gonna start off with a strength exercise. Now we both know, look, I don't like back squatting a lot of people. Like this is general population. Nobody wants to like five, you know, do a back squat for 500 pounds. So majority, even the tools there that we use are front squats, zercher squats, double kettlebell squats, right? I'm using all these different tools, still loading it, but yeah. systemic load is lower than if I was gonna hit a back squat maybe, right? Um, same thing with, with the deadlift, like we're just fitting it towards them. So I'm gonna do a, a big lift like that, like for instance, trap bar deadlift for six. And then I'm gonna do something contrast based. So med ball scoop toss, right? A squat jump, right? So we're gonna do a heavy with a power. And then, and the thing is, and, and, and they're not moving through that really fast. Even though we have a block of time, which might be 15 minutes, I'm like, hey, listen guys, work up to a top set of two to three hard sets, right? You start slow and you build up to a top set that's really hard and heavy, right? Maybe two. But they're always using this contrast set until they same thing, they peak out at their best throw at their highest jump, right? But they're supersetting that with the upper body one. So it might be a floor press, it might be a core trainer push jerk or something, or push press, right? It's gonna be heavy. And then we're gonna contrast that with the upper body explosive. You know, bent over med ball throws, wall throws, scoop tosses seated, seated if it's, a, it's something for the back, right? So bam, we hit that in for strength. And then I split it up into two density sets. One is a lower body hypertrophy, and they're gonna do three to four exercises for lower body. Maybe heavy hip thrusts, lateral band walks, you know, single leg Bulgarian split squats, and maybe, you know, some, some adduction was standing up with the band, right? We're gonna do that for 12 to 14 minutes. They're gonna get a lot of volume. It's gonna be safe. They're gonna get pump work. Everybody's gonna be like, Jesus, my legs, my ass, amazing, right? Team, gonna take a break. We're gonna do the same thing for the upper body, right? Dumbbell bench press. Perfect. <laughs> We're gonna do something like, uh, you know, dumbbell bench press and uh, a one-arm dumbbell row or maybe a core trainer row and then some type of maybe, you know, three-way shoulder raise and band pull-aparts and dumbbell curl, right? Like, and they're gonna do that and they're gonna hit a certain amount of volume in that. And then we're gonna do a finisher. It might be a core, it might be prowlers, whatever. We hit everything, right? But guess what? Over the weeks, like, they can look at getting stronger. Like, oh man, I was deadlifting 145 and now I'm at 165. Hey man, that, that feels more powerful. This feels stronger. So their strength is going up. They're getting more volume in. They're building muscle. Look, if they're eating right, which is obviously a big part of it too, they're gonna be shedding fat. And we'll, we'll legitimately go squat, deadlift, squat, deadlift, squat, deadlift. But here's the kicker. You know, we talked about cycling the loads. So the deadlift one day will be a heavy deadlift, but the next one will be band resisted deadlift. And I'm just going like, hey guys, I want you to be fast, right? And we're gonna do it for fours or fives. And now the load is lower. They're not as scared, they're not as beat up. Same thing with the kettlebells. Uh, I'm sorry, not with the kettlebells, with a squat. Like, so maybe it's like a heavy zercher squat, which we were just doing the other day. Three second down, two second pause, explosive up, heavy, right? Next time around, we might even do like an offset kettlebell squat as our main strength exercise. But now the load is way lower, yeah. but it's still challenging for them. So we're cycling that, even though we're going hinge squat, hinge squat, same thing with push, pull, push, pull. Like we're kind of cycling these loads, so they're never getting like massively beat up through their CNS, right? right? 
but we're hitting all those different things and I'm just running it through that filter. We're getting our warm ups in, we're getting our release, we're getting our resets, we're getting everything that they need. We're hitting reactive, but we're just doing it in a contrast setting because you know what, I don't have time to be, I don't have an hour and a half, I don't have an hour 45 minutes. Like, I gotta do everything in an hour, hour to 10, right? So I have these constraints, but I have this filter and then I can build everything around it. And I think that's what's, you know, when you look at a gym, it's, it's very different, right? Like if you look at yourself, look, I can be here for two hours, right? Um, hey, when I have a family, maybe I'll be able to only have an hour and 15. I'm going to have to change, and, but I'm still gonna use that filter and go like, what do I want? How am I gonna get there? How many days do I have? What's my time constraints? So I think there's still too much talk, I think, about what's optimal, right? Because what's optimal is like, dude, if you got 30 minutes, then what's optimal for that, yeah. right? If, if I have four days a week, what's optimal for that? Me personally, we talked about, it. I love still, you know, conjugate training. I love up two uppers, two lowers, you know what I mean? Max effort one, rep effort, dynamic, dynamic effort one. I, that's still my, my favorite form, you know, like yesterday I did lower, smashed it, today, upper, but it's like, I got, you know, three, three and a half, usually full days, you know, till I go lower again. And I'm cycling that too, yeah. you know, and I've been doing it for a long time and I've done every program probably that I can imagine, but, you know, and then you have tools, right? And then somebody comes in and, and it hits you with something that you're like, oh shit, okay. And, then, and you can pull that tool out of the toolbox. Um, and like a program I just wrote for a client that can only come here once a month, but they're traveling a lot. You know, they looked at it and like, they're like, oh shit, like man, you wrote this program. I don't really even need the gym if I have dumbbells and kettlebells, right? And I can do that in my garage. And I was like, well, yeah, like when I was listening to you talk, like you sounded like, like you have access to the gym, but that's gonna be at least an hour out of your day getting there and getting back, right? So if I can save you that, but all of the stuff that I put in there is gonna fit your goals. You're gonna get stronger, you're gonna build muscle, you're gonna get leaner, like we're working on nutrition. Man, and it's like he was super happy, like, oh shit, oh, this is possible. It's like, dude, you don't need to go to the gym, right? Now, at a certain point in time, maybe we're gonna crank it, and like, I'll be like, hey, dude, two days is at the gym, two days is at home, right? It, it's, it's so, um, I think I just look at it different now because I know all the geeky, know all of, but like I know yeah. a lot of the geeky stuff and still study it to a, a very, very deep degree where I can go very, very deep with it. But I realized that like, look man, if you know, Susie Sue comes in or, or Jack comes in and he's liking what he's doing and he's coming in here three days a week, we're already winning, right? And he's doing a lot of the right things. Look, I'm making their joints move better. You know, they're getting their breathing down pat. They're able to control their ranges of motion and end ranges. They're doing some strength work, they're doing some hypertrophy work, and they're doing some energy system work. Dude, that's winning. Yep. You know what I mean? And in and, and, and five years of them doing that, their life will be fucking dramatically better. They, it will be after six months, but if that becomes part of their life, you have changed their life. Regardless if fucking they did, you know, cluster sets, or you know, they got their, their ratios right, or they rested a little longer. And that's what I realized is like, how can I help them do that? And if that means like, hey, we're gonna scratch 30% of the workout and put in all this stuff that you love, and I'm just gonna coach the shit out of it, but they're like, oh, thanks so much, man, that was so awesome, like I'm smoked, whatever, right? Like, that, that keeps them coming back. And that also helps me educate them more. Hey, you know, recovery is really good. This is why we're doing this today, because of this, this, and that, and this is how it's gonna get you to your goal. And so there's so many factors in training that I, ju I just don't think, like I, I think people get so geeky that they forget that we're human beings and we have time constraints and kids and stress and you know uh, emotional triggers that make us behave a certain way. There's things that we like and people want to do things that they like to do. Why don't we help them like fitness? Why don't we help them like strength training? Why don't we help them like throwing shit around? You know what I mean? Like I look at the kids and it's like sometimes I can tell like they're not liking this. Cool, fuck it, let's play a game. Yeah. Oh yeah, man, thanks coach. All right, well, shit, then I'm gonna integrate it somehow because they're gonna keep coming back for that. And over time, they're gonna start, you know, like listening to more stuff that I say and changing these things. And so then, then the question is, is like, does your ego get in the way or are you really caring for the person? Because if you care for the person, you want them to win. And it's like, what is gonna help them win? Is it gonna be your knowledge uh, that's so deep and going like, well, listen though, what I read is this study that this is way better. They don't give a shit. Like, they wanna do, like, you gotta kinda find that compromise, essentially, you know what I mean? And that's what, like, so you have to filter, like, all these great things, but also figure out what's gonna keep bringing them back in, you know? And, and I'm much more confident about talking about, like, I, I see people go like, well, we do it this way. I say, how's that working for you? Well, you know, like, 
some people like it, but the classes aren't packed. I'm like, man, I should maybe tell you something. You know, like, we don't, you know, now we just, we undulate our team training, our group training, undulated all the time because any somebody can come in today. They yeah. did. We probably, I think we signed up two people today. Yeah. You know, we'll sign up two or three, four more on Saturday, right? They're gonna start now. Yeah. So what am I gonna do? Oh, hey, listen, sorry, dude. Like you started in mid middle of the week too, right. so you're gonna have to. No, dude, that doesn't. It doesn't work that way, right? But if, but I use a lot of stuff like podcasts and and videos and emails and everything else to explain the philosophy so that they understand it. Like, hey, in density training, you're gonna be going from anywhere from eight to 15 reps. In intervals, you're gonna be doing this and this and that. Over time, the goal is just progressive overload, right? And then you also teach recovery. Hey, why does, do some workouts feel a little easier? Because we drop the volume, because we literally are cycling it all the time, right? And so, over time, people get educated about it. And now our members, you know, it's crazy, because like, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, the reason it's like this today is because of this, and I'm just like so proud. Because when they understand it, they're more committed to it, right? And so, there's, there's so much more to this, right? Because we could go like, Luca, here's this guy, here's what's going on, da 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 da, -da make a program. And I could certainly write it down and explain everything, like this is the best program. But, you know, now there's so many other things that I'd wanna talk about whether that really truly is the best program, you know? Um, and I think when people get to that place and they're taking into account everything else, they'll start making better programs, right? Because the better program, the best program is the one that people will continue to do. Yep. That's it, period. I don't give a sh you know, on paper, everything looks really, 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 you know, you can, you can go like, ooh, that looks really, really scientific and professional and whatever, but it's like, okay, cool. Take this and let me, and, and put it in a gym, let me see if you can run this. Let me see if people keep coming back. Let me see if they're engaged with it. And, that's, and it's questionable for a lot of stuff that I yeah. see nowadays, you know what I mean? So, hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. All right. Uh, <laughs> Let's train. Let's do it. My man, what a great day. What an amazing place you've created here. Thank you so much for pleasure, dude. sharing your story. Oh man. Dude. Showing us around, getting in a good workout. You know the doors are open to you 24 seven, my friend. Always, uh, always. But on a serious note, man, uh, thank, man, thank you for, you know, like anytime I get to, to share the story and share uh, what we do here, you know, hopefully, one, it, it, it inspires, hopefully it, it fires people up to, to see that they can do amazing things if they put their mind to it. and. and you know, are not willing to stop working to get to that North Star. Um, and, you know, hopefully some ideas get spurred. And, you know, at the end, you know, if you don't take fucking action, nothing matters. So it's like, if you got something from it, take action on it. Don't wait around um, and just sit there, man. But, you know, I love you and appreciate you, my brother. Absolutely. And follow this guy, at Luca Hosovar on Instagram. Absolutely. And Vigor Brown Fitness. Yes, sir. Vigor Brown Fitness. That's Here it.
me ask you something there. Would you want it? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Pizza that would just give you one cent to change. Nah. How are you doing that? Hey, I want the edible. Thirty-seven dances in seven minutes. Dude, Jay had thirty-seven dances in seven minutes. Shit, I don't even think you have it right now. No, no, I couldn't think of it. Yeah. Like fucking Carlton. Hey, don't look at like. Not only does Dennis do the Carlton, he is fucking Carlton. <laughs> you show him the Carlton, bro. Come on, man. Really? Don't you, like, dude, he is, when he has a little mustache, yeah. he is Carlton, dude. Yeah. Fuck, is he not fucking Carlton? Right on, dude. And, Akeem is like, I'm not saying that to his face. Dude, he'll, he'll be in the fucking suit. Oh, man, my suit. That's him. That's him. Stuff is better. Stuff is better. No, it's like a way, way, way better. Carlton, whiskey. Give us a little. Give us a little. You gotta put the song on. Put, it, put the Tom Jones on. Oh, you put on Tom Jones? Put the Tom Jones on. You said the Carl the Beat? I don't ever want to get. Listen, you can't have the camera on you and freeze, man. Let's go. Let's go. But I didn't want to do this either. Oh, dude. It's there we it's go. Really there we go. No, it is not me. <laughs> He's pulling it in at the top. That's super that, hard. That changes the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd probably go. See, the thing is, like, if I'm just going up and down, I'll get that for 25. See, and, and, I, and I'll go heavy and do yeah. that, and then I'll go fucking to like 75, 80. Yeah. And then do it like that. Yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. Because, like, I mean, fuck. Yeah, I can wrap the shit out of it, but to get it up, yeah, you know, that's, that, that's yeah. the different ball game. Yeah. And then my grip will start fucking with me too. Yeah. Maybe I'll do, I'll do one stretch with this, and I'll do one like cheat wrap set with this. And you do, you do dumbbell, like the dumbbell, uh, you press, you'll do that? Yeah. Throw it out one time. I like that. Yeah. Because as soon as you wrote that, Alright, I mean, that happens to be. I, I, I feel like the first track, I can hit like, 12, 75. Yeah. 12. Yeah. yeah. I was sick, fine, 75 for 12. It's funny when I posted that Danny Vega keto counter culture. It's like, man, you've been doing this for 20 years, people don't even know. But, that, but the thing is, that's true, though. Like, for most people, they might be like, oh man, that's not, that's not a good lift. Right. Yeah. Thank you. 